day two of the Freestyle Chess Greatest of All Time Challenge in Weissenhaus is underway. Yesterday marked a successful start for Vincent Keimer, Gukesh Domaraju, and Nodirbek Abdusatorov. But can they sustain this success? Unlike in typical tournaments, the players find themselves outside their comfort zones. So you have to be very careful how you open because sometimes the first move can also bring you in a bad position. And 10 minutes is even for a grandmaster very short to get really familiar with this position. And then it can from time to time happen that even a grandmaster makes a wrong move even in the first, second or third move. This event not only offers a great opportunity for players to showcase their skills in a challenging tournament, but also provides a platform for younger generations to learn from their idols. I like Magnus Carlsen the most because he's a very famous player and the whole week he's now in Germany and that's kind of amazing. Today, rounds five to seven were played. Nodirbek Abdusatorov, Vincent Keimer and Fabiano Caruana are the top three players of the second day of the freestyle chess tournament. Despite their top performances, these grandmasters also found some of the rounds challenging. Yeah, I think my most exciting game was clearly against Nadirbek. Like, the one against Alreza, I like more got pushed down and now against Gukesh. It was over quite soon after like the center opened up and the complications worked out well for me. But this Nadirbek game was really, it's very hard to judge for humans, I think, and it was clearly the most complicated. Everyone is going to struggle in this format. I don't think you'll find anyone who plays perfectly. I think that Vincent played the best chess, probably, from, from all the players. Although Noderbeck also played really well, but I think Vincent was a bit more stable throughout, and everyone else was a little bit up and down. I mean, my tournament was also a bit up and down so far. Get ready for the heightened excitement as we move into the quarterfinals of the tournament tomorrow. Stay tuned. Eight top players, including the world number one Magnus Carlsen and the world champion Ding Liren, will play chess in a format like never before. It is the classical time control in Fisher Random. Welcome everyone to the Freestyle Chess Go Challenge. I'm Tanya Sachdev. Alongside me, like always, my co-commentator in crime, Grand Master Peter Leko. Peter, are you hyped about today? Absolutely. Uh, we have seen incredible action, dynamic pack games in the first two days, tons of action, but now it's time to slow down. Now it's the classical portion. We also have seen that the challenge on the players is tremendous, finding the right strategy right from the very first move. They have to take their time and now they will have 90 minutes to do that. And I love that because this format is all about talent, chess skill, it's about creativity over memory, opening theory, and all those novelties, those ideas that we see in standard chess, which are home prepared. Here, it's move number one, and it's go time. So that classical time control is so important uh, to really get into the depth of the position, Peter. Yes, I think that uh, basically taking uh, at least 30 minutes for the first five moves, in my opinion, this, this is a very well invested time. And there we see the format. We've had the round-robin stage, which decided the seedings of the players going into the knockout format. It will be a best of two. 90 minutes at the start of the game for the first 40 moves with no increment. From move number 41, the players get an additional 30 minutes. And every time they press the clock, they get an added 30 seconds. But Peter, it's very interesting because at the beginning, for the first 40 moves, there is no increment. And they've got to adjust to this... Uh, time control after the Fast and Furious Rapid we saw. Yes, uh, it's kind of uh, scary, right? I'm suggesting to invest quite a lot of time for the first five moves, which means that uh, if you, for example, follow my kind of strategy, more or less 30 minutes for the first five moves, of course, it's not a fixed strategy, just, just according uh, to the situation, adjusting, then you basically, that means that you have one hour for 35 moves. Yeah, so at some point you have to speed up because one thing you don't want to get into a crazy time scramble without increment because the players are already so much used to the increment in every single mm. tournament. That's some good advice there to take your time at the very start to really think how you want to position your pieces, where you want to place them, what are the drawbacks of certain pawn moves early on. And we had a lot of fun in the round robin. It was a warm up for chess fans, for commentators and the players. 
Yes, uh, also we have been missing out on some action because there were always some sparkling games, all our attention was uh, drawn to those games and then we neglected some of the other games which we feel very sorry about. However, now we have time to cover every single aspect of every single game. I'm really can't wait for the action to start to get that first position. And we saw there the standings of uh, our round robin stage, the first two days of uh, the Freestyle Chess Go Challenge, which saw Nadi back up to Satro finishing at a very cool five and a half out of seven. Uh, and this is our tournament going forward. We've got our first classical game today, the second one tomorrow. It is a best of two. The players will play one classical game every day. And even in this mini match of best of two, they start with a new position today and tomorrow and for the rest of the tournament. Yes. Every game. Yes, this is kind of a very interesting uh, aspect, yeah, so not a single position will be played twice, yeah, and uh, we also see that on the second day, if suddenly the matches end 1-1, then we will have some dramatic tie breaks, yeah, so every second day will also add a part of the classical portion, uh, the incredible excitement of uh, rapid tie breaks. Ida, can you imagine Armageddon in freestyle chess? <laughs> <laughs> not really, not really. I don't think that the players really want to get there because that's uh, super tough, but that's the event and here are the pairings. And let's take a look. We will be starting the action with some explosive matchups. The winner of the round robin stage, who finished at the top pole position, getting the first seed, Nadebek Abdu Satra, will take on the world champion Dinglerin. Ding struggled extreme. Ding struggled so much in the uh, rapid format of this event. I think we're all rooting for him to bounce back to show his best qualities. Uh, and Peter, I have a feeling we might be seeing a very different ding in the classical. Yes, I'm pretty sure. By the way, yeah, just looking at it, we know that yeah, Abdul Satov has won the round robin, Ding Lian finished last, on the last place. But now the knockout stage starts, and if Ding Lian beats Abdul Satov, then actually he's knocking out Nodi back Abdul Satov for the fight for the, for the big win. Uh, everybody has a chance. Uh, Vincent Keimer, second place against uh, Levon, who finished only seventh. But I feel like every single match is very much 50-50. I wouldn't be giving mm. any favorite role to anyone. And the other match I think that catches everyone's attention is Ali Reza taking on Magnus Carlsen. That's always a spicy battle when it happens. The two just recently played an epic grand final at the Chessable Masters. Uh, and they also had a really, a really fun game in the rapid portion of the Freestyle Chess Go Challenge. Uh, so for Magnus, it's going to be a big start. He was, he started well on day two of the event, but the end of it, uh, losing to Nordebeck in that final round, he's looking for a comeback here. Yes, for sure. I feel like uh, the, the biggest disappointment must have been uh, not winning that game against Fabiano Cariana. Yeah, that was a technical win, very much in Magnus' style. It was kind of shocking, and I believe that it somehow was playing on his mind when uh, facing Nodir back, he was still regretting missing that chance. Uh, but now it's a completely different tournament. You can just forget about everything. And this is a classical portion, a knockout. Everybody starts from, from zero. It's going to be a great day of chess. Look at those pairings in front of us. Not a back thing. Vincent taking on Levan. Fabiano Caruana, the world number two against Gukesh, one of the biggest uh, stars of the of Indian chess. Ali Reza will play against the world number one, Magnus Carlsen. And of course, uh, in the studio alongside us is also Grandmaster Nicholas. Nicholas, we are so excited about today. You're going to be keeping us true to the position. What are you looking forward to the most? Thank you, Tanya. Also from me, a warm welcome to today's first classical round. And I'm really looking forward towards the duel between the young players, the Jacks in this tournament, Kaima Abduzatorov, Firuza and Gukesh against the Kings. Because I don't know if you noticed it yet, but in every single pairing, we have the young players against the experienced players, the Kings. And so far, the Kings have not been performing well. In all of the 16 uh, encounters Peter, in, in the, the round studio, robin rapid tournament that we saw, the Kings only won one single game. That was Karana against Gukesh. In all the other games, either mm. the, the Jacks won or it was a draw. So that will be very interesting. And let's take it over to the reveal of the... The position. Daniel. We will, in just a few seconds, have the very first position for the very first time. Freestyle Chess 
in a classical knockout format. Let's head over to Fiona. Katarina Bräutigam, the German under-16 women's champion. So, whenever you're ready, please pull out the table. Okay, so which number is it going to be? Some have come out already, and it is, thank you so much, Katerina, number 529. Thank you very much, guys. Give them another round of applause. Thank you so much. So number 500, number 529, the players will have 10 minutes now. I've been asked to remind the players to please use the confession booth at least once if you can, and back to you in the studio. Thanks, Fiona. And there we have it, our first position of the first game uh, for the classical knockout between the players. Uh, and let's just remind everyone, you know, our newer audience, well, to this format, everyone is a fresh new audience. But we see the king between the two rooks in the starting position. This is, uh, this is primary for freestyle chess. We see the two bishops in opposite color squares. And these are the basic rules of every starting position that we have. Now, one of the things to always watch out that we've learned in the round robin stages is to look for pawns that are undefended. So far in this position, Peter, every pawn's defended. But we've also seen those sacrifices on G2, G7, the one pawn that only the king guards. Do you think that's a factor players need to keep in mind for this position? Well, I think that there is one good news in the position, and the, this good news is that the knight on g1 and the rook on h1 are very much like in classical chess. Mm. Yeah, so I see some pattern like white going e4, opening in front of the queen with uh, by pushing the pawn, advancing it by two, and then knight f3 short castles. Yeah, for example, this is a very harmonious. We are waiting for the position to upload in our system in order to be making some moves. But uh, these are the most important factors that I see right from the beginning. And you're pointing out uh, the king's side pieces, the rook on h1, knight on g1, and we might be heading towards some kind of a Spanish-Italian setups with a standard e4 best by test. Uh, also playing homage to Bobby Fischer who said that e4 is best by test. And then the queen might move forward to develop. The knight comes to f3, standard place, and a castle on the king's side. That could be a structure that the players are aiming for. The other point in this position is those two bishops on the queen side. On a1 and a8 on an active diagonal already. Nicholas perhaps needing just one move to come into the game. How do you see this developing? Well, my first impression is this position is not as difficult, not as tricky as the positions we've seen before in the Rapids. So, especially the players with the black pieces here in the very first game will be probably happy about it because as Peter said the knight can develop easily to f3 we can play a short castle early on put the king to safety we can fight for the center e4 comes to mind we can open the bishop by going b2 b3 immediately having this fianchetto bishop on the long diagonal a1 to h8 so I think this makes the position a bit easier than the other ones that we've seen so far it's just now the the question how Will the players start and they're discussing it right now. Yeah, and we can hear the audio of the players, so let's tune in. I need to play B3, not F3, E3, C4. This is a safe way, but okay, yes. nothing special. Yeah. yeah, this is boring. Yeah, I think E5 is fields. Okay, so E4, so E5 is the. I mean, E5 and C5, right? I mean, actually, F4 has some sense of it. F4 on the first move? Yeah. Try to control e5. And... D5? Are we sure about this one? No, I'm not sure. This That's bishop? This is kind of weird. Yeah, uh, this bishop is cool. Other knight will go here, the bishop will go to e2. Like those three. Uh, only... yeah. So e5. C5? Yeah, this is the safe way. We're afraid. I would be afraid of b4. Yeah, yeah b4 is. A... Take, we can even go d4 and yeah, we can like, just push. Or just take that. I mean, uh, f a5, c3, and we won't get too many tempi, yeah. Play move. like normal Sicilian knight, f3, d4. <laughs>
it's like C4. Okay. Take it. It's actually, I like the pawn B4, isn't it? Can I develop this? Yeah, but why can't we start with B4? So okay. before you have B4. Yeah, that's not true. I have D5 white to allow, yeah? Anyway. So you want to start B4? No, no E4, 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 E4. I don't want to allow knight of D5. Okay. This makes a lot of sense, I think. Because we play knight of Where do we put this guy? Knight B3, C4, Bishop C2, and D4. That's our setup. With knight F3, yeah? Yeah. yeah. And C4 <laughs> I like because why well, can't take control? Knight of six, right? No. Yeah, but it's doesn't look very good actually, yeah, probably. Well, unless maybe the six is equalizing. Probably not then. So if we take and bishop comes to f3. Yeah, but okay, knight e5, d6 maybe. Petra. Well, maybe can, can we play like some c4 stuff? And then what? And C4, B5. For C4. Ah, oh, no, then B5. C4. Yeah, okay, even, let's say we get this position from some move order. And I play simply D3. Okay, so D6, right? Yeah, And I play C4. this position now. Now C5 is not an idea. I mean, this is oh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's this is for We can even play B5. Even this is in the and too. B5 also. Just yeah, no, this knight there. is like. Yeah. Dead. Well, okay, it can go over here. Oh, but why do we. Mm, players uh, with that first reveal of the position analyzing we saw Nodebeck, Fabi, Winston together we saw Lavon by himself he was with a friend of his not a chess player uh, who was also looking at these interesting ideas with starting on the flank I think we're still getting some audio from the playing arena Peter yes but without really getting uh, access to their boards we can't really be using it to our advantage. What we have seen, the incredible enthusiasm, and we have been uh, listening to Nodia back yesterday, yeah, that he was saying that Fabiano, uh, those preparation together with Fabiano were incredible. But uh, let's head up to, to Nicholas, because I think you have the board. Right, we have the position here that we're going to see our first classical game ever on the highest level in freestyle chess. And there were a few things we were pointing out already. The king and the rook here, or the rook and the knight, are in a standard position. So one thing that comes to mind is that you can develop the knight early to a square like f3, and then let's say black does the same, you can castle here, and you already have the king into safety. You can play e4, you can support d4. This looks somewhat natural, at least on the king side, and then on the queen side, you can definitely open up this bishop. Question is to go one square or two squares forward, and to have some control along this diagonal. So this is why I was saying this position doesn't seem as difficult as the other ones we have seen because some things are fairly clear. What you're going to do with the king, what you're going to do with this knight, what you're going to do with this bishop. But there are some questions around these minor pieces and I think that's also what we heard the players discussing, for example, how to involve this bishop on d1, Tanya. I can imagine it being a proper Italian Spanish development for that D1 bishop that you're pointing out. The C pawn might move forward at some point, uh, perhaps to C4, because you really want to put it on C3, uh, blocking your own bishop on A1. But the point I wanted to make was, Peter, that we might see this bishop from D1 step over to the C2 square at some point along the diagonal. And we often see that in Spanish ideas and standard chess when it takes the long route to C2. Yeah, there are so many different aspects. For example, let's just make a couple of moves because one of the things we are talking about that it seems like there's a very natural flow and I feel like there's a very natural flow from the white side. But for example, let us just experience the following. We're gonna go e4, black plays e5. We play knight f3, black plays knight f6. And then white, for example, pushes the pawn to b3, immediately targeting that e5 pawn. Isn't this giving us some extra tempo yeah, that black needs to protect this pawn. For example, if he goes d6, we might just castle and, oops, why, why was that? We have to 
drag it further. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, good. So what I'm trying to say, yeah, so black castles. Now, of course, if white would be able to play d4, it would be very unpleasant for black. But what I see is that after d4, the good thing is that black can capture on d4 and the e4 pawn is vulnerable. And thanks to this uh, idea, white is not able to occupy immediately the center. So he will have to take precautionary matters before uh, starting the action. This will give black the time also to stabilize. Yeah? So I feel like this is always very important to check that the most natural kind of play from both sides, where does that lead us? Now we see the players are getting ready to start the games. Magnus and Ali Reza are first to their seats, uh, definitely with all these thoughts in their minds. What is their first move? Chad, get involved. Tell us if this is a position that you start with. How would you want to start this position? Where do you see your, play, uh, your pieces? What would be your first move? And we've done this during the Rapid, so I think I'd love to get in the predictions from you and Niklas as well. Uh, Peter, are you sticking to 1e4 as the move that we're going to see? Well, I just analyzed e4 and I was hoping that White gets the initiative, but finally I, I didn't manage to get an advantage, mm. so I'm not sure. We did see Levon sitting alone and he was somehow trying the c4, b4 ideas. Uh, who knows, maybe this is, uh, this is kind of a good uh, strategy to try to play some English kind of stuff and eventually after c4, b4 you can place that bishop on b3 yeah, and then you would have this bishop a1, bishop b3 uh, construction. Uh, very interesting. On the other hand, c4 can be met by b5. Let's Ooh. just put it on the board and then black immediately activates the rook, he activates the bishop from a8. I would at least be very careful doing that. And I think we are getting our first moves in. And Peter, on point there, great call by you. He starts with the move c4 by Fabiano, opening up that bishop on d1. And now the big question is, will Gukesh take it head on with the idea of b5 that you were pointing out? Uh, Nicholas, what do you think about this approach by Fabi? Well, we also see the same approach by Vincent, who also went c4. Well, it does make sense because they were discussing together, so they find an agreement that c4 seems to be a good move. And I have the engine open here already, and it says b5. Indeed, Peter, spot on is the best reply now to immediately open up the rogue, to immediately open up the bishop. But it is also a committal decision because you do, in the end, weaken your pawn structure a bit, leaving this pawn isolated on a7. Obviously another choice would be to just mirror black and uh, to just mirror white by going c5 yourself. So this is already a very interesting moment and I'm curious maybe we should uh, bring up the bird's eye view to see how the different openings are developing in the first few moves. Tanya. Yes, uh, we will have that up soon. Right now we see a standard English opening in this one. Uh, in a very non-standard chess position, 1c4, e5, and very often this also has some sort of reversed Sicilian ideas. And I know it can be confusing to use standard chess opening names for freestyle chess, but we might be seeing early breaks with that deep on moving forward. Perhaps you start with the, uh, let's just have this and uh, Niklas, E5 played on the board. Can we expect the B pawn to move forward as we were discussing and maybe an early D4 break here? Yeah, absolutely. B4 looks looks very sensible to open up the bishop to, to target this pawn. And like you were pointing out, this is what we call the English opening usually in standard chess. But here, of course, we have some different factors. However, one factor that is the same, let's say black goes maybe d6 or some, some move like this. If this knight comes out, we always have to be careful about the move e4, merely targeting this knight again and also gaining some space in the center. Of course, there are disadvantages as well as this bishop is opened up further. However, this is something that both players definitely have to keep in mind. So only two moves have been played, if I'm not mistaken. Well, I mean, one by white, one by black. And it really shows what now b4 was played. That really shows what Peter was saying. The first few moves are so important, so the players are taking their time. However, time management will be crucial because 90 minutes would be already not a lot of time for a classical standard game of chess. And for freestyle chess, even more so difficult because you have to think from move one. Peter. Yeah, now also then let's move around. For example, let, let me bring the Vincent game against 
Level not only and we do see that Levon is taking his time already after move one, after c4, and I'm loving it. For example, there we have seen Gukesh against Fabiano going e5. Yeah, I will even put it here. So Gukesh opted for e5. And after e5, Fabiano played the move b4, and I somehow feel that this c4, e5, b4 is helping white a bit. We talked about it that eventually white would love to develop that bishop to b3. White is coming with the pieces, and now uh, Gukesh is somehow having some trouble with his e5 pawn. That do I protect it? That uh, that does waste the tempo. Uh, Levon, in any case, is probably still thinking. Did he make a move? Uh, yes, he did. He decided uh, for now to play some copycat chess. We have c4. We have a symmetrical reply by Lavon Aronian uh, with the idea of controlling some central squares. He takes the shot, making sure that b4 doesn't appear so easily. But even then, it is an idea always in the air where you start activating your rook. I am expecting some peace development early on here. Maybe knight f3? Well, the question is, uh, do you slow down or do you continue? Because one thing we have to give credit to Levon, yeah, the big strategist. He knows that he plays against Vincent Kaimer and we have been seeing him sitting there alone uh, preparing. And he was pushing those white pawns C4 and B4. So he, he somehow sensed very much that Vincent is a, a strategist. Yeah, he's usually not playing E4. First move, he's more like a D4, C4 type of player and he has anticipated it. Nevertheless, Levon did take his time. Yeah, he, almost three, three and a half minutes uh, he invested in order to make sure that, yes, I'm adjusting to the new situation. And it is a new situation for the players uh, starting in the classical time format. They can't, they can't really afford to land up into trouble out of the opening, which is what we saw happen very often in the rapid format the round-robin stages, but with so much time on the clock, it's a wise decision to invest it early on at the start of the game. And we're going to head over to one of our marquee matchups, Magnus Carlsen with the black pieces taking on Ali Reza. And they go for the idea that we were discussing earlier. I want to say a king spawn opening, but in this case, a queen spawn opening. Yes, e4, e5. Well, if we are talking about Ali Reza and uh, Magnus, e4, e5 is very much in. Yeah, also in the classical portion. Uh, and now it's very intriguing. We do see the evolution bar suddenly after e4, e5, claiming that white has some advantage. I'm not sure if that's really true, uh, but first of all, the players don't have access to computers, so they have no idea whether after e4, e5, white has any chances. We have been trying out some things. Yeah, I was following, I believe, with knight f3. Then we had this discussion that after knight f6, and look at this, already the evil bar, no, okay, is moving back and forth. One thing I would like to mention, what happens if white plays the scotch and white goes d4? And if e takes d4, then white plays e5, for example, a very aggressive uh, treatment. And it's kind of also a big question, does black capture on d4 after d4, for example? Tanya, what is your take if white is so aggressive? It's so strange to have these queen on e1 and e8 and to get your idea, your head around the fact that the kings are not in their initial position, but it's the queens. So the pawn on e4 is defended. I would be also tempted to try to keep that e5 pawn under defense. I would want to make the move d6, but the problem with that, and I want to highlight this is, uh, Peter, so easy to forget that bishop on e1 in these positions. White can perhaps take on e5. You want to start directly with b3, but I'm also thinking about the idea of just capture on e5, fix that pawn on e5, and white's the one that strikes first with the move b3, opening up that bishop on a1, and black's got early troubles to handle. Yes, exactly. This, this was one of the main worries that I had when I looked at the position, yeah, that what happens if suddenly white will the one striking first on the e5 pawn, which already brings me to the uh, question, like after e4, e5, knight f3, maybe black should not even play the move knight f6. Maybe he has to do something else. Maybe opening up the bishop first with b6s and knight f3, no, it's not yet on the board. That's a long thing by Ali Reza. He's really taking his time to understand. I'm just wondering if there are these other ideas in the position. Speaking of concepts of the king spawn opening in standard chess, this square is occupied by the bishop in chess, which is why very often when white or black makes the move d3 or d4, you open up the diagonal to strike on the dark squares. I'm just thinking, can white ever dream of either to place the knight on e2 and Peter, don't be too mad at me. 
or h3 and the point is that i want to go shock castle and strike immediately with the move f4 the difference i see in this is that there's no black bishop here knight h3 is I know it, it goes against your principles completely, Peter, and you're probably saying, what is Tanya even talking about here? But I'm just wondering if this is a concept that perhaps Ali Reza can be thinking about at all on the radar? Well, knight h3 is very much in the king's gambit spirit, right? Yes. Because, yeah, knight h3, you're going to go short castle and then strike with a very quick f2, f4, and I'm really loving it, and I think that every single minute is very Ooh. well invested. Okay, he goes for b4, also opening up the bishop. Yeah, you can highlight it. Yes, Peter, uh, the bishop opens up, so a big threat on the board right now. Not only opening up the bishop, I just want to point out something to think about later on. We might be seeing a potential rook lift in the middle game, Peter, and transferring all the way to the king side. Well, knowing how aggressive Aliaza is, I wouldn't be ruling out. <laughs> And I somehow feel that this, yeah, e4, e5, this whole position, yeah, when, when we had it, that uh, Nicholas also mentioned, we, we talked about it, that it looks so natural and it looks natural from the white side. We have tons of ideas, but black needs to somehow find a way to neutralize white's initiative. That's the main task and it will be a very big challenge. All right, well, this position, again, really interesting start. Nicholas, what are your thoughts on the opening action that we're seeing? And we were talking about moves on the king side. Ali Reza with a completely different approach. He starts with b4, but an idea that was on our radar. Yes, it was just a matter of which move to play first. And Tanya, you'll be very happy to hear that your idea of knight h3 or now knight h6 is the preferred choice by the engine. And that is so against our common chess understanding to put a knight on the rim. There's even a saying a knight on the rim is dim. But in this case, to support this potential push f5 or also to avoid running into a potential f4 later on, maybe even already here, it would be possible and to further increase the pressure on this pawn e5. And it, if black takes on f4, white simply goes d3. White will win back this pawn sooner or later. And most importantly, this bishop is so powerful on this diagonal, unopposed over the whole board, pointing towards the black king. And, well, already black is in some trouble here, suggesting now h6. Let's just make some normal moves, like d6 or well d6 knight c e2 knight c let's just say castle something like this and we see white regains the pawn knight f3 castle next have the rook lined up on the half open f file and the white advantage is increasing so after b4 Carlsen keeps mirroring with b5 and now once again knight h3 is quite a good move to develop the knight to h3 supporting the f4 push and opening up this bishop because this bishop can be really a powerful minor piece in this position. B5 by Magnus Carlsen. So I've noticed this about freestyle chess. Very often we see uh, black actually mirror the opening moves of white. Where do you think that's coming from? Because that's a completely different concept from standard chess. Yes, but it's kind of understandable yeah, that uh, you don't want to show your cards yet. You, you understand that your opponent's last move made perfect sense, yeah, for example. And knight oh, h3 wow. on the board, yeah, Ali Reza in his element, yeah. <laughs> wow. this, is, this is creative chess at its best. Knight h3, short castle, f4 is coming. And now we have just had three moves and look at Magnus. What is this reaction? He's not happy. I'm pretty sure that he's not happy because he feels and he senses that there will be some very dangerous challenge coming up. And look at that king on f8. If white really gets castles f4 very quickly in, then black's king will be very vulnerable. And going knight h, for example, let's just follow. If black plays exactly the same way, knight h6, castles, castles. And the bad news for black is that it is white who strikes first. And at some point, this uh, copycat game gonna end. For example, he takes f4, we might be taking back with the rook. And then the queen is going to g3. That g7 square that we talked about, very vulnerable square, is, uh, is making life really tough for black here. And it's so impressive how Ali Reza took his time in the starting position, putting together, piecing together the different ideas that you see 
in the Spanish, in the Italian, in the King's Pawn opening, in the King's Gambit, and then coming to the realization that unlike standard chess, you can have a unique approach in development. You never want to put the knight on the edge of the board. Knights on the rim might be dim in standard chess, but in freestyle chess where the pieces are placed randomly, ideas like f4 can become incredibly strong early on. Uh, and very impressive start by Ali Reza in the opening phase. Yeah, very impressive. I somehow intuitively felt like, okay, E4 is, is a very dynamic move. Yeah, I'm also an E4 player myself. Ali Reza is clearly an E4 player. Yes, he knows all the other openings as well. But uh, if, if we think about it, it's, it's clearly one E4, his main weapon. And we had, we had this direct camera angle on Magnus. And I haven't really been seeing Magnus so worried uh, right after the opening phase. This is not, not Magnus in his comfort zone. Look at this, he's leaning back. How do I handle this challenge? How do I handle these problems? If Castle's F4 comes and he knows that Ariza is very dangerous, he's very aggressive. Yeah, just give Ariza this attacking position and then probably no might in the world can stop him. We speak about stylistic approaches of these players and I completely agree with what you're saying. That the way this opening, the potential of the way it started and how it's going to develop, it is very much up on Ali Reza's alley, the kind of chess he likes to play, the kind of aggressive, combative, chaotic positions that he likes. He is one of the most creative players and we see his attacks are always, are almost, a lot of times at least, intuitive based. Uh, a lot of potential of that happening in this position as well. We've been talking about the ups in this position for Ali Reza. Nicholas, how can Magnus actually handle these ideas and what is the way to keep things under control uh, for the world number one here? I have to say I'm still fascinated by this idea of putting the knight on the rim in this particular chess 960 freestyle position. And in fact, and we can get to this in a moment, in every game so far that I've seen where knight of six or knight of three was played, it was an inaccuracy or even a mistake. So very interesting that the knight really belongs here on the rim. Maybe because also usually in standard chess you have a bishop on c1 which could maybe take this knight but here with the bishop on a1 you don't really have to worry about that and that your pawn structure is weakened. And in this position where Magnus is thinking he should actually keep mirroring Firuza for now. He should also play knight h6 preparing short castle. So for example, let's say short castle now and short castle. But it is clear that if you keep mirroring, at some point this extra move that white has will have an effect. So now f4 could be played and this all looks very logical and it's certainly a line that Magnus is considering right, right now. And well, maybe here black can take and then target the pawn on e4. So this might be very much a direction we will see after knight h3, Magnus is thinking, and he should keep mirroring knight h6. So the knight belongs to the rim here, supporting also the push f5 and not being in the way on f6, where maybe even the bishop could go later on. Big decision for Magnus, Peter. Wow. Actually, I would like to get back to you because I had this position on, exactly the same position that you kind of said that the computer agrees that things are good. After e takes f4, for example, rook takes f4, how does the computer want to play? Because humanly, we are just very mm. much terrified by queen g3, queen take g7, checkmating ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And it's important to get another defender into the game here. So to go knight e7 to put the knight on g6, wow. where it really stops any action along the g-file. Also, black gains the tempo, hitting the rook on f4 and then putting some more pressure on this pawn. So white should probably go d3 to defend the pawn on e4 once more. Knight g6 looks very sensible. You could respond with lining up on the diagonal, queen c3, very nicely, <laughs> nice battery here. But f6, and it seems to be somewhat safe, still a very complicated, very difficult position. Maybe black can strike in the center with d5 as well. Still some disharmony with the bishop on d8. This could get very, very interesting very soon, I believe. And Magnus has to figure out how to move forward after knight h3, he's still thinking. Wow, but this is fantastic. So the key move is in fact what Magnus has to see right now, because it's clear that mirror, because he sees that this knight h3 castle's f4 is a very nice idea. So he wants to get his king to safety. 
I'm pretty sure that he is really pondering along these lines, but he has to see Knight is such a game changer. Yeah, all of a sudden that Knight goes to G6 and my heart is perfectly satisfied from black side. Yeah, I have no more questions. I feel that that's a stable position. And that's an idea, a concept that we often again see in standard chess king spawn opening where the black knight transfers itself from G6 to G6 via another route C6, E7, G6. I think it will be in Magnus's radar. It's all about understanding that he needs this knight to come on H6. The other knight goes on G6, and the black king after castle feels extremely safe then. But this is a crucial decision, and even though it's an early start of the game, and I think this is what is unique about freestyle chess, that very early on, there are critical decisions to be made. Far more earlier on than in standard chess, where it's only way into the middle game that these critical moments rise up. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, this is a very big uh, difference and one thing that we felt like the players can't really be, you know, optimizing in the ra rapid portion, right? Because mm -hmm. there you have to make up your mind faster. And we see already Magnus spending more than 30 minutes uh, for his... Uh, sir okay, he already spent time for the first and second moves, but uh, now he's really taking his time. And as uh, Magnus goes into a think, a much required think in this position, we're going to zoom out and bring up our bird's eye view. Uh, Niklas, you mentioned that there was a different pattern of development chosen on the other boards with the more natural kingside knight heading towards the center. But it wasn't the most accurate way to play. Take us through what's happening. We've got the boards in front of us. Uh, and once again, we're seeing very different setups on each of the boards. Yeah, let's go to the English opening that we mentioned early on between Karana and Gukesh. The most moves have been played here. They have been moving fairly fast. So let us go through it from the beginning. C4, E5. This would be called the English opening in standard chess. Now B4 was played. And here Knight F6. Knight F6. The computer criticizes, I mentioned it already, it wants to see the knight usually heading to h6 here as well, or maybe play d6 first. And here also knight f3 was criticized, also here knight h3. It's just such a foreign <laughs> concept to anybody really who has been playing chess for a long time to put the knight on h3 when usually always putting the knight on f3 or c3 is the natural way to go. But this is freestyle chess, so different ideas, different concepts, it really depends on the specific position. So knight f3 hit the pawn on e5, black goes d6. Now b5 was played quite interesting to me that Koana spent another pawn move here when it's still the opening phase and he needs to develop his pieces. He spends another move to gain some space and plays b5. Probably I'm guessing to prevent b5 from black. So this was important for him to not allowed this option. Now b6 was played, opening up the bishop, castle, castle, e3, and knight e7. Also here we see this maneuver, the knight probably heading to g6, the bishop to e7, and fairly soon it feels like we will see a position which really resembles a normal chess position. Just a question what to do with this knight and this bishop on the on the first rank, but it seems to me that, that Gukas found a quite solid way to enter the game, Tanya. Yeah, and the position that you have on the board, uh, it also exemplifies and shows that that knight on c8 in the starting position, in many cases, belongs on the g6 square. So understanding that, but for Fabi, getting it there, knight e2, he also has to calculate the outcomes of black actually trading that bishop on a8 for the knight on f3 and destroying the king's side pawn structure. It's a it's a double-edged move because you, yes, you double up white spawns on the F file, but you give white a lot of chances on the G line. You give up a bishop. Uh, so you really have to calculate the pros and cons of the situation. I think to me, so far, in this very first game of the classical freestyle go chess challenge has been the key takeaway, this square for the knight on H3. This is such, again, once again, a foreign concept in standard chess to develop your knight to the edge of the board to try to open up the F-file. And the one player who succeeded in finding that, the only player who succeeded in getting that set up is Ali Reza Feruja. And that goes on to show why he was also the only player Magnus Carlsen wanted to face in a World Championship match or in the Chessable Masters Grand Final. His creativity just sometimes blows my mind. 
Yes, it's fantastic. But also to to make sense out of it, somehow humanly after e4, e5, knight h3 already makes so much more sense, right? Because you know that we talked about this king's gambit spirit. Yeah, we want to push f4. And uh, in all this English kind of position, c4, e5, and then if somewhere goes knight h3, okay, then, okay, this is someone from a completely different <laughs> planet. Uh, really impressive. And it's that's why nice to kind of consult also the computers, the engines, uh, because they bring this X element. And I know I'm talking with the players uh, during the dinner, before the dinner, and they're always so excited. Uh, they tell me that, did you see Peter, the computer afterwards told us that this and that and that would have been the way, yeah? So the players are very much uh, following what the computers are suggesting because they are perfectionist. They would like to get this essence of each and every position. Clearly, we have so many different positions. You, you can't be protecting. And we talked about it that the knight on c1 and the bishop on d1 are the two kind of weird pieces. Okay, one could argue also the white screen on e1 is doing not much, but this bishop on d1 is at least beautifully protecting that f3 square, which you highlighted, yeah? Because if, for example, the bishop would go somewhere, then of course bishop takes f3, and if the pawn structure sh should be damaged with black's knight going to g6, mm -hmm. eventually to h4, targeting that uh, f3 weakness would be too much to handle, but uh, with the bishop nicely on d1, Fabian is also now asking some question that please decide. There is a strategical question here as well. Yeah, that if, for example, black plays the most natural move, knight g6, reinforcing the e5 pawn, do we consider a move like d4, d5? Because it has pros and cons. On one side, it's so tempting to lock that bishop out of the game, right? It's completely locked. On the other hand, we give the c5 square. So let me just put that pawn to d5. And then we highlight the bishop is dead on a8. Yeah, we don't have to worry about anything. So now clearly all the action will be happening eventually on the king side. But that knight from f6 immediately jumps to d7. It goes to c5. Black will follow by with f7, f5. And finally the bishop from d8 can land on f6. And it will be a very nice kind of king's Indian type of structure where we would be saying that, hello, who did play b5 and d5 together and <laughs> weakened that c5 square forever? Yeah, so, so many fascinating uh, questions to every single position. And uh, Gukesh is now taking his time to understand what he has to pay attention to most. The one thing that I would be very reluctant as black here to do would be blink first and ease off the tension. I don't think capturing on d4 would be something that I would happily make. Uh, play here, white would recapture. Uh, pleasant recaptures. Intuitively, instinctively, I'm also very tempted to go with my bishop, but I think you can also take with the pawn. Actually, that's a good question, Peter. Without going into deep into calculation, if black was to, in fact... Uh, liquidate in the center. What does white recapture with here? Well, I think we have a lot of options, uh, but maybe the movie takes d4 is not as bad as it looks. Yeah, because, and he goes e4. I wanted to highlight Keeps that it. there is there is this move, e5, e4. It's a very double-edged move as well. Uh, there are a lot of pros and a lot of cons to this move. Yeah, now knight will most probably go to d2. Yeah, that's kind of the natural move. And then black goes knight g6. Let's have it on the board. Yes, knight g6 or knight f5 even. Knight d2 on the board. Yeah, knight d2 on the board. Now the big question, knight g6 or knight f5? It's a, it's a very tough question because if white eventually will break with f2, f3, then maybe I would love to have that knight on f5 in order to put pressure on the e3 pawn. It's... Uh, mm. And vi black plays d5, okay, that's... That's kind of interesting. Yeah, black is playing for the d5 square. Honestly, I did not see that coming. So after knight d2, instead of moving, jumping ahead with the knight, Gukesh took the decision. Didn't take that much time. Uh, goes for d5. This is his concept. And this again passes the ball to Fabiano. Uh, I don't think Fabi will consider taking on d5. It gives a really nice stronghold in the center to one of the knights. Maybe it's a possibility, but I would be first tempted to look at c5. Niklas, uh, what do you think? What should be the reaction for white here? Well, first of all, I want to say this was quite powerful play by Gukesh here. Both e4 and d5 were the preferred choices of the engine mm. to grab the space and to lock down the position and potentially attack the white king on the king side further on. So e4 was strong. Knight g6 or knight f5 we were considering, but here this move, Peter, that you mentioned really gains in strength to play d5. You open up the square on d4, you lock the bishop out from defending the pawn and uh, knight from b 
from c1 can come to d4 and white has a very nice edge. So this is why d5 was played and now you suggested c5 Tanya and probably black will just keep it as it is not taking on c5 because that would open up the bishop and instead this this move c6 is possible. Black is better prepared for opening up the position on the queen side and also a4, a4 is it this clear? Makes, makes a lot of sense to keep the tension, not allowing the black pieces to come into the game. And now, well, black could maybe increase the pressure on the pawns by going knight d7, knight d7 to hit the pawn on c5, forcing white to show his hand to release the tension to take on b6. But of course, you could also defend it. Knight db3 or knight cb3 look very sensible to me. And... This is tricky. I mean, the players have to calculate a lot. I guess you could take on c5 now, take on b5 and win this pawn. However, you open up this bishop, which always scares me because this is such a monster on this long diagonal. So I believe after d5, if we come back to the current position, this is the current position, yes. Um, Fabiano will take his time to consider, should he take on d5? Should he play c5? I mean, c5 threatening c6 and locking out this bishop is a very, very attractive choice, of course. And probably black has to respond by c6. And then the question is, who gets the upper hand on the queen side? And Fabi is taking his time. It is a critical moment here. Again, once again, right in the opening, in the first few moves, because the pawn structure that Fabi determines right now, whether it's to keep the tension, to take on d5, or to go for this idea, which to me appealed a lot to push that c5 pawn. Maybe it's a very direct approach, uh, but it will determine the course of the middle game, the structure, the pawn structure, the piece placement. Uh, Peter, as Fabi thinks, there's another player who's been in a very long thing. And I think we're gonna pull up our bird's eye view and jump into the action because take a look at that extreme right board we're exactly where we left it and that just shows how difficult the position is magnus carlson is yet to make his third move in this game yeah and we talked about it that it's how tough yeah after e4 e5 b4 b5 knight h3 the position is very alarming we have seen his face also on our camera very i don't know worried is maybe too much of 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 uh, an overstatement, but look at this. Magnus is not feeling happy. He, he feels the tension and it's a knockout event. If something goes wrong in this game, right from the beginning, it might be very difficult to bounce back. By the way, I'm seeing another knight h3 and that's Nodiebek Abdusatulov who wow. took his time and also developed his knight to h3. Big credit goes to him. We have been seeing him in stellar form throughout the round, Robin. And we also will have to check out uh, those games yeah, between Vincent Keimer and Levon Aronian and Nodia back up to Sato Wagons, Ding Liren. Uh, and we can see that. Uh, that's the first board on the left that Peter's pointing out. We see Nodebeck. It's a different structure. He's playing against Ding Liren. A different approach by Ding compared to Magnus. Uh, so far, Ding has managed to strike in the center with d5. Meanwhile, on the Vincent Levon board as well, we see some trades have happened. Black has managed to bring the dark squad bishop out. And despite the piece activity on that second board from the left, we see that the evaluation bar seems to like Vincent's position just a little more. And I think it comes down to that bishop on a1. We see eyeing that king side. We will deep dive into these positions uh, very soon. Fabi, on the other hand, has decided to keep the tension doesn't decide with the C-pawn, but is rolling up uh, the board with his A-pawn. So keeping options open there. Peter, I'm going to leave the option to you now to decide which board should we go to next. Yeah, well, we have Vincent on our camera. I think that's why let's go to the Vincent game. Uh, but very interesting. We have been seeing that Fabiano, Vincent and Nodia Beck were discussing together. And I just want to highlight one thing that Vincent and uh, Fabiano opted for c4. Nodia back, who was part of that group, went for e4. Yeah, it just shows that, yes, the players are discussing, but it does not mean that they are absolutely agreeing on everything. Uh, we will be dealing with Nodia back's game right after. So c4, c5, b4, very much in my split. I wanted to challenge that c4 pawn immediately with b5. Now, Vincent does that against c5. C takes b4, rook b5, I just feel like this is very much in the banker spirit, yeah? You get this better pawn structure, the bishop is opened up, the rook is activated immediately. 
uh, Levon played the move bishop a5, rook b1, yeah, the rook is coming back, but we might be getting a tempo with knight b3 on that uh, bishop on a5, knight d6, so yeah, Levon is trying to um, hit that pawn immediately while the bishop is pinning the white queen, however, okay, I don't really believe that this should be an issue, so c5, played knight e4, now be careful, black is already threatening, knight <laughs> takes d2, all kind of checkmate or not checkmate because you can sacrifice your queen, but it basically means resignation, however, this uh, would be too naive to think that this would work because white plays knight b3, the tempo mm. move that we talked about, the knight hits the bishop, protects, guards the d2 pawn, and ask some very unpleasant questions to black, yeah, that if you retreat them, why did you be so active? And Levon is trying to be principled with bishop oh, b4. I think we're getting Magnus in the construction booth. Wow. Let's hear him. We're going to we're going to tune into Magnus as soon as we have the video and the audio coming in. Okay. So um, he's found a very interesting idea in the opening connected with knight h3, a quick castles, and then playing f4. And I was thinking for more or less twenty minutes now, um, which means that I've spent like a third of my thinking time already. But that's. That's kind of the point of, the, of um, this game. Anyway, I went for a really drastic measure here, um, bringing the knight from the queen side to the um, to the king king side. Uh, I'm prepared to uh, give up on the pawn um, on a7. I think of uh, development um, on the. Yeah, bring the knight to check and the other to f6 after I played a quick d5, but I don't know. It was more of a desperate measure than anything else, because I don't like my position. So was f4 scared him. Yeah, it was a very interesting idea. And after spending more than 25 minutes he came, ah, and Levon is joining us already. <laughs> so, yeah, this first c4, c5 was, of course, a kind of a desperation try. Because uh, somehow uh, Gukesh, uh, Ding, and Magnus didn't join me in analysis, so I was <laughs> analyzing alone. Well, the other had the team, so I thought that I really need to surprise my opponent somehow. And, of course, c5 looks wrong because of b4. It seems like white is getting an upper hand. I thought of this idea at knight b6. I don't know if it works or not, but at least uh, I'm not being over overpowered by uh, four people who analyzing the same position <laughs> while I just checked it alone. Uh, I think uh, objectively it should be slightly worse for black, but I, th I, well, I'm thinking now maybe I have chances to equalize after rook c1, b6. C B A B uh, Rook C four Bishop D six something like because uh, because I think that if White goes for D four to stop Knight C five after F three then I have this F five F three Queen F seven Rook C one something like Knight H six and he cannot capture my piece because Queen F two I take and then I castle and I have a good play so I don't know. We'll see how it works, but uh, I'm up on time, and uh, I I definitely managed to surprise uh, Vincent. So time to uh, use that uh, extra time I have. Wow! So we heard the first part of uh, what Levon confessed. Uh, we we have been hearing him saying that. Uh, right here, he's thinking about rook c1, b6, mm -hmm. c takes b6, a takes b6, and he believes that he should be close to equalizing. He believes that probably white is better, but then we missed everything what he said because suddenly the sun went off. I, we really hope that uh, the audience had been hearing all these fascinating insights from Lev. And really interesting how he said he was analyzing alone there. 
uh, Levon uh, just by himself and he felt, you know, he might be uh, overpowered in the analysis uh, with, the, uh, with the kids who were analyzing together. So he decided to go for the C4, C5 position, despite knowing that it's uh, playing with fire. But he does believe that if he's able to achieve B6, opening up off that A8 bishop as well, uh, he should be in the game in this one. And we also got insights on Magnus. If we just show everyone what Magnus was talking about, really, he said that he was very impressed with this approach by Ali Reza. Uh, with this knight coming out, and he could feel that this could be dangerous. Went into a long think, and we can see that on the clocks there. Has decided to bring his knight to the king's side, the idea that we were discussing. Uh, and eventually feels that he wants to get in a d5 break, right? Well, no, actually what he was saying that this knight c7 is, uh, is a kind of a pawn sacrifice. Yeah, Because after knight c7, now white has the option of taking on e5, bishop takes e5, then clearly he wants to follow it up with knight g6 and bishop d4. He did mention that the pawn on a7 is hanging. And here he said that he is relying or counting on some quick development, uh, taking on e4 and then developing knight f6 castles quickly, that's what I somehow mm -hmm. understood. But if already Magnus Carlsen felt the need to sacrifice the pawn, because otherwise his position might get uh, too dangerous, it shows that he really felt under pressure, right? You, you don't just sacrifice this pawn uh, willingly so, so easily. Mm. Uh, it's very interesting. Very interesting. I might have misheard. I thought he said something about the d5 square, uh, but uh, clearly the position that we have on the board right now, the pawn on e5, if you just go to our live board, Peter, the current position, the pawn on e5 is hanging and Ali Reza is taking his time before he grabs it with all these ideas of the queen on e8 opening up eventually pressure on e4. It's going to be a fun battle, this one. Let's pull up a bird's eye view before we deep dive into one of the positions. Ali Reza in a long think, and there we have it. Uh, Niklas, we've got our four boards in front of you. What catches your attention? Oh, it's difficult to choose. Let's go back to the game between WoW, and he has played it. Vincent against Aronian, and A3 is the computer's top choice and maybe a move that Aronian had not on his radar. He was mentioning the move rook c1 which is very natural to defend the pawn on c5. So what is a3 all about? Not only are you not defending your pawn on c5 which can be taken, you're offering another one. What is the point? If black takes this pawn on a3 now your pawn on d2 is not pinned anymore so actually d3 followed by queen a5 is just winning material. So what is going on here? Let's figure this out. All right, so knight takes c5 can be answered by knight takes c5, bishop takes c5, and now a very powerful double attack here. Queen c3 suddenly wow. threatening checkmate on g7 with this battery bishop oh. and queen on the long diagonal, as well as hitting the bishop. You cannot defend against both threats, and white is winning a piece. So really marvelous idea here by Vincent. And if the knight retreats to another square, let's say to f6, then the queen comes out to a5 and the bishop is trapped. And also here, white wins a piece. So after a3, one thing is clear that Aronin cannot take on a3. He has to take on c5, in fact. And now this pawn on f2 is hanging. So... You don't have time to go d3 or f3, something like this. Instead, I'm sure Vincent's idea is to take on c5 to eliminate this dark squared bishop and then probably push ahead with d4 and e4 immediately, claim the center. He has the two bishops. The engine also approves of this decision. And wow, powerful play by Vincent Keimer here against Levan Aronian. Tanya. Playing for the initiative, and Levon's got to go for this line. There are no alternatives. As you pointed out, that was such a nice double attack with the queen lining up with the bishop on c3, and so easy to miss. Uh, the idea that you showed with the bishop on a1, queen c3, there's a checkmate on the king's side, your bishop's hanging, but of course, Levon sees it all. He captures it with uh, the bishop after knight takes bishop, knight takes knight, 
we might be heading into this direction. I think it's a lot of compensation. With that bishop on a1, that can't be challenged. I like how Winston's going for the initiative in this one. Yes, I also like it. And look at his time management. Yeah, he already spent 36 mm. minutes for the first seven moves, but it seems like it's worth it. Yeah, he's uh, definitely following some strategy that we kind of saw the bot. Yeah, that there is just no reason to rush because if you get the upper hand, and you have been playing the rapid portion, yeah, then automatically you can speed up. But if you end up in trouble, then you can even burn half an hour, one hour on the clock, the position will not get any better. So, uh, and knowing that Levon is the one who loves to play with the initiative, yeah, he is the one who, who is loving, and look at this, he's sitting there, he's not walking, he's, Levon is not walking away, uh, because he understands very much that, yeah, Vincent is coming back, he's gonna take that bishop on c5, knight takes c5, White will play d to d4, hitting that knight with the tempo. Where do you go with that knight? And the dark squared bishop, White will occupy the center. And just let's point out a similar idea to what was shown earlier, to just show the different tactics that exist. If you fall back with the knight to the center of the board, you go knight e6. White can think about pushing that d5 pawn. And now don't come back with your knight to c5, Peter, because once again we see the lining up of the bishop and the queen, and there's no more the e6 square to fall back to. So this is a really critical tactical concept that exists in this position with the queen and the bishop so quickly uh, threatening a checkmate in one. Yes, and okay, also jumping back to e4 doesn't look that natural because white will get this extra tempo of f3 and e4 and just keep on pushing. Black still will need to develop that knight from g8 as well. So do we talk about something like maybe black has to play the knight a6, you Oof. know, knight on the rim and the other knight on h6 just to hide because white will be advancing d4, e4 and everything in the center. Yeah, so maybe this is the best strategy and then try to hang on, hang on there for a couple of moves, castles, b6, let's get some harmony, but at the same time, Vincent will be going e4, knight f3, developing the queen, uh, castles and going with the initiative. And uh, Vincent has traded off on C5. This line that you're pointing out, you know, we, we play around, we see these different options and we realize as commentators that perhaps knight a6, knight h6 is the setup to be taken here. But for a player to go for this voluntarily, not, uh, you know, really having, of course, the assistance that we do with the evaluation bar and Nicholas keeping us to the good with the position, it's just very difficult to develop like that. You put one knight on the edge, the other knight on the edge. I mean, knowing Levon, the kind of chess he likes to play, he'd hate to see those knights there. Yeah, absolutely. He hates it. He would love that. Okay, please, let's turn it, yeah? <laughs> I can give you my time, you know, I can give everything. Just give me, give me the white pieces. On the other hand, I feel like the good news for Levon is that everything else seems to be just borderline almost lost, yeah? So, you know, to stay in the game, he needs to settle down on this idea psychologically that, okay, those are the only moves, I have to make them. By the way, I don't see how white is punishing it. Yeah, after all, black has, black has an extra pawn. So if you somehow get unpunished, one good news I see for black, for example, okay, just let's put this knight on a6, white plays e4, so we go knight h6, knight f3, castles, we castle as well, and then eventually black, I don't know, Sometimes like f6, queen g6, knight f7. Yeah, you can somehow get some harmony opening up with b6, for example, b6 or b5, the bishop. It's not, not that clear because if black's queen gets to g6, suddenly there will be also pressure against the e4 pawn. That's also the reason why I'm thinking that maybe white should not even place his knight on f3. Maybe white should also go for some knight h3 ideas to be more flexible with, with fc kind of ideas now that we know that this is, uh, this is very much in the spirit, right? We can just develop that knight on h3 and then we will have also f3 ideas. The bishop eventually can also come to f3 if we feel like. Clearly, I believe that the bishop more belongs to b3, but just keeping all the options open. Really interesting. It promises to be an exciting middle game, this one. Vincent already has sacrificed a pawn. He's playing for peace activity for that bishop pair. Meanwhile, Black's piece is still struggling with development. We can see that bishop on a1 already. Quite a monstrous piece once that d pawn moves forward. The bishop on a d1 has some good squares for development. The rook on b1 hasn't made a single move, but is already on an open b file. Things looking good so far for Vincent. We will bring up our bird's eye view and check in on all the boards. And there we have it. We see on our extreme 
left. It was another knight h3 idea by Nodebeck, the opening setup that took Magnus by surprise that he was very impressed with. Nodebeck goes for the same one, and we see the eval bar has slightly creeped up in Nodebeck's favor. You can see the two bishops that are lined up beautifully placed there, and even though the queens have been traded off, I see an extra pawn there for white. So Nodebeck up a pawn, then we see Vincent, we've delved into that position, Peter. It's looking good for him right now, but he has to prove that compensation long term. A lot of tension on the Fabi board in the center. And meanwhile, both players on Magnus Ali Reza, every move, they're spending so much time and it just goes on to show how difficult this position is for them. There are so many things to keep in mind. The F4 break, the D4 ideas, the pawns falling. And then you have to understand that if you fall into trouble early on, it's so difficult to get out of it. Magnus has sacrificed the pawn. The big question, will Ali Reza take it or not? We will find out. But first, we will take a short break. We leave you with some highlights from yesterday. We'll be right back. Day two of the Freestyle Chess Greatest of All Time Challenge in Weissenhaus is underway. Yesterday marked a successful start for Vincent Keimer, Gukesh Domaraju, and Nodirbek Abdusatorov. But can they sustain this success? Unlike in typical tournaments, the players find themselves outside their comfort zones. So you have to be very careful how you open because sometimes the first move can also bring you in a bad position. And 10 minutes is even for a Grandmaster very short to get really familiar with this position. And then it can from time to time happen that even a Grandmaster makes a wrong move even in the first, second or third move. This event not only offers a great opportunity for players to showcase their skills in a challenging tournament, but also provides a platform for younger generations to learn from their idols. I like Magnus Carlsen the most because he's a very famous player and the whole week he's now in Germany and that's kind of amazing. Today, rounds five to seven were played. Nodirbek Abdusatorov, Vincent Keimer and Fabiano Caruana are the top three players of the second day of the freestyle chess tournament. Despite their top performances, these grandmasters also found some of the rounds challenging. Yeah, I think my most exciting game was clearly against Nadirbek. Like, the one against Alireza, I like more got pushed down and now against Lukesh. It was over quite soon after like the center opened up and the complications worked out well for me. But this Nadirbek game was really, it's very hard to judge for humans, I think. And that was clearly the most complicated. Everyone is going to struggle in this format. I don't think you'll find anyone who plays perfectly. I think that Vincent played the best chess, probably, from, from all the players. Although Noderbeck also played really well, but I think Vincent was a bit more stable throughout, and everyone else was a little bit up and down. I mean, my tournament was also a bit up and down so far. Get ready for the heightened excitement as we move into the quarterfinals of the tournament tomorrow. Stay tuned. Three questions on Vincent Keimer. How are you enjoying the freestyle chess greatest of all time challenge at Weissenhaus? I'm very much enjoying it. Of course, also playing well helps, but in general, also the place in itself, all the organizations from playing hall, the, how the breaks are organized for us, food, everything's really good here. And it really helps you focus only on chess because everything else is taken care of really well. What makes freestyle chess so challenging? It's simply different because you're aware that basically your first few moves could be huge blunders without you even understanding it, which is like completely different from normal chess. And normally first five, at least five to ten moves, you just know by heart and you can like blitz out and be sure that everything is perfectly fine. Here, like we might make one logical move that we think is good, which is just horribly bad, and it's not even easy to understand why. Which game did you find most exciting today? I think my most exciting game was clearly against Nadirbek. Like, the one against Alireza, I like more got pushed down and now against Lukesh. It was over quite soon after like the center opened up and the complications worked out well for me. But this Nadirbek game was really, like, it's very hard to judge for humans, I think, and that was clearly the most complicated. Stay tuned.
The players looking good in Weiss and Haas, the chess looking even better. It's been quite the start to our first uh, match of the knockout, the classical time format. Very fascinating opening ideas, approaches. We see the world number one in a big thing. They're already using, burning so much of their time on move number three. And that's what we love about this format. It's not about the opening theory. It's not about the home preparation. It's all about the chess skill. And these are our four live current boards. Decisions have been made. And we see finally there is action on the Magnus Ali Reza board on that extreme right, where eventually the F pawn did move forward. There has been a trade. Meanwhile, on the Norderbeck board, a big advantage for White there. Up a pawn, it's an endgame. And Peter, let's deep dive into that one. Uh, Niklas. I'm going to hand it over to you to take us from the top because it looks like Norderbeck has managed to get a big advantage against the world champion right out of the opening. Yeah, one could say the trend is continuing from the round-robin rapid, rapid tournament that we saw where Norderbeck won in convincing fashion and Ding Liren had a terrible tournament ending on the last rank. So let's go from the top and see how we got there. E4, B5 was played. B4, both players opening up the bishops. And now again, this move, knight h6, was preferred by the end. And we've seen it so many times. So unusual to put a knight on the rim, clearing the wave to play castle. Knight f6 instead was not the best choice. The knight is just not ideally placed in this position on f6. D3, E5. And Nordebeck did it right. He played the knight to h3, supporting this push, this lever f4, to put pressure on the center and open up the bishop even further. And Ding was probably quite worried about this prospect of f4 coming. And also Nordebeck is a very strong attacking player, very dynamic, great calculation skills. So maybe that influenced Ding's decision here to sacrifice the pawn on e5 in the fourth move already. Because of the d5, e takes d5, the queen is opened up, the bishop is also attacking the pawn, so this is a pawn sacrifice. And Nordebeck took the pawn with the queen, queen takes e5, the queens come off, bishop takes e5, now castle, white also castled, or well, not yet, bishop f3 first, no, white hasn't castled yet, but he can if he wants to, rook e8, bishop f3 makes sense, developing the bishop also Oppose, opposing this bishop on the long diagonal, rook e8, hits the bishop on e5, bishop to d4 back, hitting, oh no, well, <laughs> I was thinking this pawn is attacked, but actually the knight is still defending it, so that's why black went bishop e7, developing the bishop, attacking the pawn on b4, and in the break, Peter was saying, well, this looks like a marshal gone bad, black is a pawn down, but where is the compensation? The queens have been already traded, so there's no attack against the king. And it looks like a healthy extra pawn for Nordebeck. Now he has to deal with the potential threat against the pawn on b4. But he has different options. He can play a3. This looks very sensible. He could also trade the bishop. Personally, I wouldn't like to do this. It is right now the preferred choice of the engine. But in either case, Nordebeck with a clear advantage. And if he takes this game, if he wins this first game, of course, he would be in great shape to win this match. Tanya. I would hate to give up my light squared bishop in this position. It might be the top choice of the com com computer, but such a hard decision to make. Bishop from f3 taking that knight, inviting a black's light squared bishop on d5 to never be challenged. Uh, I understand that white eventually would put that f2 pawn to f3, blunt it out, put that knight from h3 to f4. But Peter, I do not want to part with this bishop. Yes, unless it's absolutely necessary. And one of the things that uh, caught my eyes when looking at this position here yeah, and talking, where is the compensation? First of all, immediately in the break, I, I claim that, yes, it's it's not the typical anti-martial uh, compensation because white has the pair of bishops, yeah? Those were my very first thoughts. And then bishop takes d5 does not fit into this category. On the other hand, yeah, one has to keep an open mind that now we have this fixed structure, b4, b5 pawns, so by giving up our light squared bishop, there is the c5 square to rely on. Yeah, thanks to this uh, small nuance, yeah, that uh, this is a fixed structure, we can think about it. But humanly, clearly, the most natural move would be to play a3, and the most natural reaction would be immediately to undermine it, undermine it to hit it with a7, a5, create some mess, force white to 
make some tough decisions because b takes a5, bishop takes a3, that's already a different situation. Also, somewhere some c7, c5 hitting that lovely bishop mm. from d4, yeah? All kinds of things, but a5 maybe can be met also by c4. There is so much to calculate. And Nodir back rightly taking his time. He understands that for sure this must be a better position for, for white. A pawn? Yes, a pawn. But it's a mini match, yeah. If you suddenly rush with your decision and then miss on an opportunity, that would be psychologically a big blow for him. He has to take his time, find the right way, and put the pressure on black. And during the break, we felt that Nordebeck has all the reasons to be pleased about his position. But the more we dive into it, there are questions for White to answer. As you're pointing out right now, uh, the B4 pawn is hanging. There's Bishop takes Knight, take away one of the attackers. There's A3 defending the pawn. There's C3 defending the pawn. To A3, I completely agree with you, Peter. You've got to calculate A5 and you have to have a response to A5 because you really don't want to take on A5, allowing the black bishop to capture the A3 pawn. The B pawn can eventually move forward. The A5 pawn will be quite weak in the future. On the other hand, if you play a move like C3, again, black has got his own ideas. Perhaps the knight can jump over to B6, eventually land on A4 and start targeting the C3 pawn. So it's also not an easy decision. The third way to defend the B4 pawn, which I, at first sight, was very against, and it just felt like it's not a happy move to make to give up your bishop pair. And I completely agree with you. You can't have these preconceived notions about these kind of positions. And I feel the younger generation fights that so much more easily. You know, we see the likes of Nordebeck, Vincent, Prague, Gukesh. They're able to take these kind of decisions without having any of these biases which we might have in these positions. Yes, absolutely. And also, all these uh, gatherings, these evenings uh, spent uh, with the players is always very nice. I'm asking them some innocent questions like, okay, yeah, how do you like it? And, and I can see it in their eyes. Yeah, they are, and their eyes are shining. I'm, I'm liking it. Yeah, it's the answer of, of Nadir back. And of course, you like it if you keep on winning <laughs> and if you are, keep on delivering one billion game after another. Now, one more aspect that white has not yet castled, yeah? So white will need to spend the move on, on castles. And we are also talking about the knight on the rim situation, yeah? And this bishop takes d5 move, which we completely ruled out at the beginning, makes sense that we don't lose tempo on protecting the b4 pawn, right? Bishop takes d5. Bishop takes d5 will give us the chance to activate that knight with, on f4 with the tempo. And we will also have time then to castle, yeah? It's uh, suddenly, sometimes, time is very essential in order to coordinate our forces. But then we get closer to a kind of a martial compensation for black, right? Where you... No, only if black can push c5. Because that's always connected. There usually white has pawns b2, b3 against b5, c5. Yes. And that's always the dynamic factor why black has long-term compensation. There is no need to worry about long-term play because you know that you can rely on them. In this fixed structure, if white stabilizes and eventually this knight from c1 lands on c5, then we'll be talking about, wow, that's a monster knight. We won't be talking about the beautiful light square bishop anymore. Really nicely pointed out. In the standard martial position, black sacrifices a pawn, has got a strong bishop activity, peace activity in the position, and a lot of space in the center where we see the C pawn moving forward, sometimes the A pawn moving forward, sometimes even the D pawn uh, moving. Well, it's picked up, but we can see the central space a lot of times in that opening. In this position, there are dark square weaknesses to deal with, but I, I'm still hesitant to take on D5. Three options for Nordebeck to consider here. Bishop takes knight, defend the pawn, defend the pawn. If you had to predict knowing Nordebeck's style, which one do you think he's going to go with? Well, he's spending now all his time. I'm very happy about it. Well, if he takes bishop takes d5, the first thing I'm going to do, I will start uploading, yeah? Because it, just shows, I ju it just shows that, yeah, this youngster have this completely open-minded spirit, yeah? Bishop takes d5, before the break, if you ask me, I said no. And now we are talking about it all the more. I'm, I'm loving it because bishop d5, bishop d5, knight f4, and then going for the c5. And, and he does it. <laughs>
<laughs> there we go. There we go. Big appreciation. Just amazing. Yes, fantastic. This understanding of the position and relying on concrete calculation, on the essence of time in these positions, and not having, not playing on intuition or this feeling that, you know, I want to hang on to my bishop because you don't give a bishop a, and immediately jumps in with that knight to f4. It's not... Let's also point out an easy thing to miss that the knight on c1 does defend the a2 pawn, so it's not hanging. But this is what the whole, uh, this is what the point I was trying to make, Peter, that these youngsters, they don't care about these principles, these general concepts uh, anymore. Computer engines have changed all of that so much. Yes, exactly. It, and it's so fascinating to see. And, and uh, the thing was, look at this. He is blinking also quite a lot. He's really worried. He understands that, wow, yeah, this bishop takes d5, which was so, so much not in the spirit at the first view, right? But when it happens, then it hits you that, wow, but this is a great idea. We are talking about the dark squares and about time. Yeah? And white is able to uh, coordinate his forces. Wow. Yeah, and head and hands now for Ding, because... You never think that this will be the possibility. Your opponent will actually give such a beautiful bishop, leave your light squared bishop unchallenged. It's not even something that's really on your radar. You know, you're, you're like, okay, if it happens on the board, I'll always have long-term compensation. But once it appears, you start seeing the problems in the position. White's knight is now into the attack. Uh, you've always got the option to go castle next, c4 in the air. Long-term plan to break out and very important, knight jumping into b3 once you've taken care of this idea. We're talking about all of White's ideas, the different plans in the position that give him a lot of play and an additional pawn. For Dingleren, where will he find his compensation? He's in a think tank. We'll zoom out of this one, Peter, and we will check in with another position uh, that perhaps, Nicholas, you had your eyes on. We saw some moves being made in Magnus versus Alireza. Alireza playing with the white pieces. Get us up to date on that because it started to look more and more like a King's Gambit to me. Absolutely, and this is really an exciting battle. It is, for me, definitely the game of the round between these absolute world stars. And Firuza is playing true to his style. He did not take the pawn on e5 in this position, where Magnus went into a confession booth and said, you know, I had to somehow deal with the threat of f4. Let me bring the knight to g6, and I'm even giving up this pawn. But Firuza said, no, I don't want to take any pawns. I want to attack you. And that's, this is his style. He plays so aggressively and he does it so well. So he goes f4 still. He takes f4 and now he castled. This is the short castle. So the rook is lined up against the king already. The pawn on f4 is attacked one more time. Black will not be able to keep this pawn. Magnus goes for his plan, going knight g6. Also now threatening the pawn on f on e4 with the queen and the bishop in the corner. So d3 was necessary to protect the pawn and white is ready to take this pawn on f4. And now bishop f6 was played. And I was analyzing, I was looking at this position already because this makes a lot of sense. You want to neutralize this bishop, this very strong bishop on the long diagonal. So here's a sample line that I was looking at. After bishop f6, white can take on f4 which makes a lot of sense. But one thing you have to be aware of this is that now after a bishop takes a1, rook takes a1, there's knight takes f4, rook takes f4, and queen e5. And at first, this looks like a deadly double attack against both of the rooks, which you cannot defend at the same time. However, you can play the move queen f2, suddenly threatening on f7. So if now black takes the rook on a1, this is not going to end well because the rook comes in, protected by the queen. The king has to step to the side. And now, at the very least, you could collect the rook on b8. Maybe there are other options as well, but this is, this is, this is pretty good. Queen f8 followed by rook e8 is threatened. Checkmate, so if black takes on c1, then queen f8. This is very close to checkmate already. Yes, it is checkmate in the next move here. So... This is one line which is really, really crucial because it allows white to play to play like this, to take on f4. And, well, while I'm talking about it, and this would have been a good choice for white, we actually have moves and, and Ali Reza did not go for this. He instead, after bishop f6, he took on f6. And this is helping black to develop. Knight takes f6 and now he's probably going to take back on f4. But this helps black to gain some time and Magnus is coming more 
back into the game. Maybe a missed opportunity for Alireza, Peter. Yeah, I also feel like, because now after knight takes f4, I feel that black can simply play a short castle. Yeah, I very much love that move. Let's get our king to safety. And yeah, let me even make it. Yeah, just castles and everything seems to make quite some sense. Uh, because, okay, knight takes g6, h takes g6 would be kind of tempting and natural. The reason why I preferred this sequence of moves to knight takes f4, rook f4, because to a, to a human eye, castles, rook takes f6 is an absolutely no-go. This sacrifice is just way too scary. g takes f6, bishop g4, the bishop gets to f5, the queen comes to h4, and suddenly already we are talking about direct checkmating ideas. So, int wow. It's, um, yeah, it's a difficult position for me. Maybe I should have opted for knight e4, knight d6, and tried to settle on c4, but I thought after d5, uh, it's very unlikely, you know, at some point that uh, my bishop will ever come to the game. So I settled for the uh, structure, but it uh, looks really bad for me because, uh, well, it's not clear where I'm going to castle or, or if I'm going to castle at all. Um, the only advantage I have is, I mean, that I'm up on the clock, but the position is, yeah, it's extremely unpleasant, I think. Uh, it should be practically lost. But we're hopeful, you know, because <coughs> there are, this is not, not the worst position I ever got. So I'm just going to fight and try to find my best moves. Avon Aronian there, not happy with his position at all. I just say, Peter Fessy, I love these confessional boots where the players come, they share their thoughts mid-game. Uh, and I wonder if it's also their way of just, you know, sort of venting it out. And it's really nice to see them come forward and express their thoughts in this position. But coming to the position itself, Levon said it feels like a bad French. Uh, and I think that's that bishop on a8. You know, the French is famous for that bishop on c8, which struggles to come out in the game because of pawn structure. In this case, that bishop, I mean, what bishop am I even talking about? Uh, the king, as he mentioned, hasn't castle yet. He said it's looking almost busted for him. I think there are ideas of kingside attack as well with the rook from b3 eventually lining up on either the f file, putting pressure on f7. The knight can jump to either g5 or f4. Things are looking bad for Levon. He's feeling bad about his position. What do you make of it? Yeah, certainly it looks extremely dangerous, but one good news is there for Black, that the bishop on a1, which we know in the win of French, yeah, that uh, this bishop is, if it ever reaches this diagonal to a3 and targets here something yeah, and it gets into uh, the stomach of Black's position with bishop d6, then it's almost automatically game over. But this bishop is still far away. The knight typically often goes knight f4, knight h5, targeting that g7 pawn and also getting ready for some knight f6 sacrifices. One, uh, one thing also catches my attention is that I might even not be willing to castle at all. There is also the other kind of setup that we just go knight f4 and then we go h4. We activate the other rook also by the h3 square that white king can simply... Uh, feel quite safe and secure and parked on, on G1 without castling. There are so many uh, different setups. This is a little bit the only worrisome thing for Vincent, that he has so many options. And Levon clearly going B6. He has also revealed us that he does not want to decide his king's position yet. Maybe knowing that how big of a fox uh, Levon is, he is dreaming of Bishop c6, first of all, bishop c6, bishop a4, bishop c6, bishop b5 check, bishop c4 would be a dream scenario. Getting that queen out to d7 and going long castle, just getting away from all the danger zones. And we know Tigran Petrosian was very famous for some dangerous French type of position. What did he do from h7? He started walking king g8, king f8, king g8. And this is very much in all of the Armenian chess players' blood. Yeah, they, uh, they were raised on all of Tigran Petrosian's games. So that's definitely something that he is thinking about. He mentioned it in the confession booth as well. But the problem in achieving that would also be the f7 pawn weakness. With ideas of the knight jumping onto g5, with this rook sliding all the way to the king side, let's just point it out, either to the f3 square or the g3 square, depending on where black decides to put the king. 
it's going to be a very tough battle achieving all these moves because Levon is still, he still needs about four to five moves to get his king to the queen side. And that feels like an eternity in this kind of a position, Peter, to me. I'm already looking ideas of a rook transfer to the king side. Uh, these potential knight jumps in the air. It's looking extremely scary uh, for white here. Niklas, uh, we're, we've been deep diving into this position. Are we overestimating Vincent's chances? Does Levon have a path to defense here? We're not overestimating Vincent's chances, and Aronia said it very clearly. He believes his position is lost. This might be a drastic statement as of now, but already a few moves earlier, there were some other ways how Vincent could have set up his pieces even more strongly so. But still here, he has a very strong advantage, and what you said, Tanya, makes a lot of sense. Bring the rook over to f3, target this pawn on f7, and this idea, knight g5, is definitely in a position so that we are actually forcing black to, to play short castle. So, for example, let's, let's make a move like bishop c6 that we mentioned. Now we can go knight g5 and black has to short castle to defend this pawn f7 and there goes the stream of tucking away the king on the other side of the board. So, let's play this out castle. And now white can really concentrate on attacking this king. Maybe push the h-pawn forward to also involve the rook place the bishop on this diagonal, maybe bring the bishop back, the bishop on a1, bring it back to c1 on this diagonal, and white can really concentrate. And this extra pawn that black has really doesn't make any difference right now. So rook f3 seems to be a tempting option for Vincent. And one thing he does have to be very careful about is his time situation. However, 40 minutes or 38 minutes, he's almost half an hour behind. And we should not forget that the players are not getting any increment. That's all the time he has until move 40, and that's still 27 moves away. Ah. So Vincent really has to make sure that he still has enough time in the critical moments then when he maybe has to find a winning way against Aronian. That's Tanya. a really good point, Nicholas, that you're making that 38 minutes, 27 moves, no increment. You've definitely got to be feeling the pressure. And we can see that Winston is feeling a bit of the tension. His heart rate currently is at 107. Uh, so it is spiked up right now. And Peter, in this kind of a position, you know you're better, but you have to keep it under control on the clock. Levon at a more stable 82, although his position's all over the place, but Levon's always the calm guy. Yeah, and he's also the big poker face guy. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a t typical uh, characteristic of of uh, Levon. Yeah, he is also always trying to show himself calmer than he is. But we see that he's calm enough with with 83, with the king on f8, with all those threats <laughs> looming. But I still feel like this knight on e7. This is a nice knight. Yeah, it can jump to f5, block to f file. Yes, it might run into g2, g4, but that's a, that's a weakness. Then the knight can jump to h4 with the tempo, hitting the rook. So there are many, many resources. And uh, I did mention uh, Tigran Petrosyan, but there is also the legendary Rafael Vaganyan, who has been playing all kinds of terrible French uh, kind of positions. I have had completely winning position against him and then losing it because he was defending and in time trouble I did not find my way. Yeah, Vincent is showing some sign of nervousness. We see his heart rate. He understands that, yeah, in the next couple of moves, he has to make some progress. And there we go, Rook FC on the board. I like it. It's a move that I think is a f it's something that comes to mind. The moment you see this Rook on B3, Black's King on F8, you really want to get as many pieces into the attack, into the firepower uh, of trying to target it. And most importantly, in, in the French, in standard chess, there's always this F6 break that Black can rely on to take care of this weakness. But in these positions, it's, it's hard to imagine F6 ever happening even once Black does achieve the Shark Castle. So for now, Lavan Aronian is in trouble out of the opening. He's calm with his heart rate, but I think his, his position is anything but calm right now. Meanwhile, Winston at 110, and it feels like it's rising uh, more and more with every move. We will check in back with the players in this one. So far, we can conclude that... Oh, wait, Winston in the... Yeah, so I think we've kind of finished the opening phase right now. 
Before playing i3, I spent a lot of time calculating whether f3, knight c5, bishop takes g7, works with the idea of king g7, followed by knight d4 with the threat of first of all the rook of b4 hanging, and also there's knight f5 or queen g3, knight f5, but I didn't see how to make it work after a5, queen g3, king f8, knight f5, knight e6, and g7 is protected. So when calculating all these lines, I already had foreseen that I had also have this opportunity with a3 as I played in the game. And I think, yeah, I mean, I'm a pawn down right now, but still I'm rather happy with my position. I think compensation should be at least, should be maybe even more than enough. The king's side attack is happening. I have the pair of bishops, knight on a6 and bishop on a8 are both pieces that will take quite a lot of time to get to a normal position again. So I think I will have to use that time to attack on the king's side, but of course he will try to block, I think, with something like h5, g6, knight f5. And yeah, then of course there again, again there are the dark squared weaknesses, but I think it will be a very complicated fight. Uh, Winston really breaking it down for us. I think those were some amazing insights into the position. And uh, Peter, you're going to show us the line that Winston was pointing out, but I'll just point out the bigger picture of it. He mentioned these four minor pieces, the bishop on a8, knight on a6, bishop on a1, bishop d1, saying it will take time to find the right, uh, right spots to get them into the game. But despite being a pawn down, he's happy with his position so far. He knows there's a complicated fight ahead, but feeling pleased with the outcome. But there was this complicated line that he mentioned early on. And Peter, could you break that down for us? Yes, it was this critical position where he actually went on to find this stunning move A to A3. Uh, but probably he was actually very unlucky that he did find also another alternative, the stunning peace sacrifice that he mentioned f3 here, hitting that knight on e4, and after knight takes c5, he wanted to make the brilliant bishop take g7 work. King take g7, knight d4, joining wow. the knight is joining the party, the rook hits the bishop with a tempo, and then he was uh, trying to, for example, queen g3 check, king f8, knight f5 might be checkmate because of queen g7, so black will have to run out with his king to f6, complete craziness. It was enough for him to burn 20 extra minutes probably for this line, which <laughs> might actually come back to hunt him. Yeah, if, if there would have only been this a3 choice, he would have played after 10 minutes and he would not have one hour on the clock. Uh, yeah, this is when you see too many brilliant possibilities. And calculating all these chaotic lines, that 115 heart rate, uh, that explains it why. Uh, but Winston, tactically very sharp, he is very aware in this position of these uh, opportunities. He said he couldn't make it work, decided to go for the alternative. And let's bring up our live current board, Rook F3, Levon still feeling the heat in this position. It's going to be a bit of a task for Levon to find a defense, but we've seen him be so creative with his resourcefulness throughout the event. So I think uh, it's far from over right now. Uh, and I'm going to turn over to Nicholas to tell us... Uh, what, is, what do you think about Winston's breakdown of the position that he mentioned? And as well as this line that you have up on the board, a resource for Levon. Yeah, Winston was spot on with his breakdown of the position. He is down a pawn, but he has excellent compensation because of various factors. And one main one being his space advantage and the bad pieces here on the queen side, his bishop pair. And he was now expecting Levon to deal with this threat of knight g5, hitting the pawn f7 and forcing the short castle, which is something that white would like to see to, to know where the king is placed and how to attack it. He was expecting that Levon might go for h5 so that after knight g5, he could respond by going knight f5 and not have to worry about g4. However, h5 is also quite a committal move because, well, also now, kingside castle becomes less attractive since you have weakened your position here already. And Vincent mentioned he expects a setup of g6 and knight f5, but if you really put all, this, all the pawns on the light squares here, you severely weaken the dark squares, and if this bishop comes back via, let's say, c3, d2, and g5, let's just play a sample line here. Let's say what goes bishop c3 and just for the sake of argument black plays g6. Then you see that this bishop can be quite close to the king, enter on all of these squares and be very much unpleasant. Maybe this is not the exact way to do it. As we can see, the engine doesn't improve fully, but these are the ideas in the position. I'm bishop, curious. Bishop c6, by the way, on the board. Oh, bishop c6 on the board. All right. So 
this is actually a move that we saw and now we saw a knight g5 this is something we analyzed and now after knight g5 i believe black would be very much forced to castle either now or give a check first but a check doesn't really change anything because here after knight f5 g4 you could maybe still argue about knight h6 to defend the pawn in this way but it looks very very shaky the knight here on the corner and this is not one of the good knight positions that we saw earlier so this seems to be quite promising for white all right let's go back to the position of the bishop c6 what is your take on it, Vincent's Well, after bishop c6, we suddenly had seen Vincent Hartray jump to 124, clearly sensing that, no, no, hang on, somehow this bishop c6 wasn't a good move. I'm threatening. My idea was to go knight g5. I was expecting h5. What is Levon going to do after knight g5? And then Vincent blitzed it out, and now his heart rate is down to a more or less normal 100, 800, 910. This is kind of the normal Vincent's heart rate. <laughs> wow. That's quite high for a normal Vincent heart rate, 110. Uh, ha I mean, I'm just amazed, but this position calls for it. I think Vincent can feel it, that it's going in his favor right now. Let's just quickly dive into the threats that are there, Peter. Knight g5, not only attacking f7, but there's a threat of knight takes e6 because of the pin on the f7 pawn. And knight f5 would be the natural looking response in this position. You might have the option to throw in a check at some point. I don't know how much that helps black. A uh, Bishop b5, king g1, but the, but the main thing that I want to focus on is that after knight f5, G4, how does white continue this, uh, uh, the attack? And I see that Valbar doesn't like knight f5 too much. Well, knight f5, g4, like Nicholas uh, said, yeah, if knight the black six. knight has to go to h6, that's not the knight h6 move that uh, we have seen before and we were praising that the computer suggests. No, this is a desperate measure. First of all, the knight on g5 is parked eternally. Yeah, there is no way from black side to kick that away with h6. White might just follow up with some very simple moves like bishop c2, putting pressure on the h7 pawn. White's king also gets this very nice... Uh, Square G2 against any kind of bishop B5 checks. Uh, this is this is a dream come true. Yeah, it, you you know exactly that black can't really be holding on forever in these structures, and I don't really see Levon going for it unless he believes that he, yes, the knight on H6 is terrible, but it will give me the time or the chance to eventually still evacuate my king towards the queen side. So there's so much intrigue here. And I'm just wondering. Peter, that in this game, from the very start, Vincent has been in driver's seat. He, did, he had this early pawn sacrifice, managed to find the counterplay really quick. Do you think that Levon's idea of taking this opening structure of c4, c5, the very first move that we saw allowing b4, do you think it went wrong that early on? Yeah, pretty well. First of all, my very first intuition when I was talking about my first prediction, like, I want to play c4, but I'm afraid of b5. Yeah, that was my first intuition, yeah, that after c4, what happens if black plays b5? That, that was the only thing what was hindering me from going c4. And basically, if you know that this is my kind of concern, then after c4, c5, I'm definitely going to play b4. And I'm extremely happy having exactly the same position that I, would, I was worried about with the extra pawn on c4 and white is getting the structure advantage. So Levon might have felt that, okay, let me go for these adventures but something heavily uh, backfired here for, for Levon, yeah, because this was too ambitious, but you just can't jump around with two of your pieces, hoping that, that it works because uh, you, you get punished for it. And we've been talking about this. Pawns in front of knights in the center are so much more important. Uh, very often, if you do place your knight in front of the pawn, it can come under a lot of heavy threats. For Levon, this one has gone wrong very early on. Uh, Peter, let's zoom out and bring up our bird's eye view and check in with some of the other action that's going on. And very quickly, we're going to jump over to the Nordebeck board. He was up a pawn. He took this decision. Uh, and we are going to go into first a con Hello everyone. Uh, this the opening phrase didn't work so well for me. Since I missed his idea D3, after that he can play F4. So my knight, second move knight of six might be a mistake. And I play D5 sacrifice in, in spirit of martial gambit, but now I'm 
upon down I have to play for the draw. And we couldn't exactly capture the essence of what Ding was saying, but what I did say, what I did hear him say was that he made a very early mistake, as early as move number two. Yes, as early as move number two, he is blaming his second move, knight f6, hitting that bishop because he completely missed the idea of simply going d3 and after e5 that white will have this f4 idea and he panicked. Yeah, just like with Magnus, yeah, his feeling was he spent 25 minutes Wow, my opponent wants to attack me directly, my king is in danger, okay, let me sacrifice something. And uh, he went on to... Yeah. Maybe we'll just pull up the... Yes, Peter, if you could just show that one more time on the analysis board. Yes, so knight f6 is the move that Ding is blaming all his troubles on. First of all, but we talked about this, take your time, Ding, just don't rush, don't hurry, these are so tricky positions. And I really hope that by seeing Magnus' example and Ariazas and Vincent's that they are taking their time, they are ready to invest 20, 25 minutes as well, just to get some safety, some stability, because what's happening here? To knight f6, d3, e5, knight h3, you get a hard attack. You see that your opponent is gonna cast a short, he comes with f4 and he just delivers checkmate to you with the bishop on a1. This is, this is shocking, yeah? And no matter how much time you have, finally, out of panic, we unfortunately missed out on his uh, second swords, but basically I understand that already d5 came out of desperation, he sacrificed the pawn just to survive uh, at least that scare, but it came at the cost of a pawn. We already analyzed this, and what happened next? Bishop takes d5, bishop takes d5, knight f4, bishop c6, bishop c5, at least he's activating the knight, but okay, white is a pawn up. He had to give up that pawn to try to neutralize the pressure because of the panic and the difficulties in the position with this knight h3 idea. All right, so still Noderbeck, clearly the one who's pushing, but he's still got some work to be done here. He still has to show that masterful technique Look he did at against this. Magnus. Look 117 heart rate. For the, for the very calm Ding Lian, 110 is going wow. down to 110, 111, but extremely nervous. Yeah. I mean, nerves are 100% at display here. And Noderbeck, meanwhile, at a more stable 90. Well, he's got a position he can enjoy for a long for a long period of time. He showed some great technique. I was just about to say, Peter, against Magnus in the round robin in that Rook Pawn endgame. He's got to bring out that level in this endgame as well to take this to the full point. He's up a pawn, but Black still has this bishop activity, that light squared bishop. The knight on b6 now potentially jumping on to a4 if it's not kept under check or a central square. We will come back to this one. We can conclude this by saying that Noderbeck doing very well out of this. Up upon. Let's zoom out and let's check into our marquee matchup. Magnus Carlsen taking on Ali Reza Firuja. That was fire on the board from the very start. And there we see Ali Reza on our screens. He's completely focused. There was a moment that Nicholas had pointed out where Ali Reza perhaps missed an opportunity, a slight inaccuracy, but you can't fault him because he played such a natural move, uh, not being able to calculate those tactics with Queen E5, sacrificing a rook. But has Magnus, is Magnus now out of, uh, out of any danger? Can he breathe a sigh of relief now in this position? Well, looking at uh, what's happening after knight f4, suddenly Magnus did not play the most natural move castles, yeah, that was so obvious to us that, okay, let's get the king to safety. He instead tried some very interesting idea, queen e5, but let's take a look. Did it really work or where does this lead us? Queen g3, very nice. Yeah, now, first of all, black is already unable kind of to, no, okay, he, he can steal castle, but there is this trick. Let me just uh, pull it up like after castles, knight take g6, luckily for black, can still give a check. Because after queen take gc, there would be the intermezzo 97 check winning the game on the spot because white wins the piece uh, thanks to this tactic. So after queen g3, anyway, Magnus's idea was first to bring the rook, bring the rook to e8, protect the queen. Clearly, he's hoping to get the desired time to castle. But did he have the time? Knight take g6, h take g6. Yes, okay, queens are traded, but rook b3. What a fancy idea, suddenly, all of a sudden, the danger is coming from a completely different angle. Wow. Looks like you have survived the attack. We have been talking about white is coming with f4 and we'll try to target black's king. And all of a sudden, it's all about the a7 pawn because of this fixed structure, this b4, b5 pawns. And a6 had been played. 
Now we are still dealing with also some rook c3 ideas. Rook c3, if we can provoke something like c6, then that bishop on a8 is really feeling ugly. White's knight is able to jump. Yeah, and the same applies if white goes rook a3, you can still follow it up with knight b3 with ideas, knight c5, knight a5. It's not looking like a happy endgame for Magnus. Classy chess by Ali Reza. And this reminds me so much of uh, the similarities that Magnus Carlsen pointed out in a recent interview between chess and football. He said, in both these sports, you overload your opponent on one side of the board and very often you end up scoring on the other side of the board. Ali Reza in this game starts with putting pressure on the king's side, forcing Magnus into a defense, pulling all his pieces, the rook, the queen and the knight, all over to the king's side. And then suddenly, being the attacker, it's so much easier for him to switch on the other flank of the board where it might be that the position gets decisive, or at least the pressure gets really going uh, on Magnus Carlsen. He has to watch out for those queenside pawns now. And as a defender, as on the defensive side, it's always more difficult to find the resources to shift your flank. Yes, very much so. And also this king on f8 is still not feeling that happy there. All of white's pieces are coming. For example, I also see white's bishop eventually going to f3. And then black will also be dealing with some d4, e5, because d3, d4 would come with a tempo hitting that rook. Then e4, e5 would come with a tempo hitting that knight. Black does not have this stable structure. The last move, a6, was kind of necessary in order to try to set up a defensive setup. It would be very interesting to hear Nicholas' uh, view that how bad is Magnus' position right now? It is bad, but it's not lost by any means. However, the last sequence, especially this rook maneuver to b3 to target the pawns via the a file, or maybe also the, the c file, was very, very nice by Firuza and probably missed by Magnus when he went for rook e8 in this position. Instead, he could have also taken on f4 or, or play castle. Both of these moves would, let, would have led to a slightly worse position. However, as it happened, rook e8 in this trade, he is not out of the woods. Beautiful anecdote by, by Tanya there with how Magnus talked about the similarities between soccer and chess. And here we see suddenly out of nowhere targeting this pawn. And in this position, it seems that it makes the most sense to go rook a3 first, because if rook e6 to defend the pawn, then knight b3 is already a huge problem since knight c5 cannot be prevented and if you play d6 well then you're not defending the pawn on a6 anymore and why can simply take this pawn and this up a healthy pawn with a winning position so instead after rook a3 what you need to do which also makes a lot of sense to go bishop b7 and now to bring the rook over to c3 also target this pawn on c7 and if black goes let's say c6 now why did we why did we lure the bishop to b7? Well, if we now play knight b3 and in the future knight c5, then we gain another tempo attacking this bishop here on b7. In either case, either the direct rook c3 or the move rook a3 are the ways to go for Ali Reza to follow up with knight b3. And he has a nice endgame here. He can press. And this reminds me a little bit of the end game that Magnus lost yesterday against Norbeck. There, it was much, much worse than this one. However, he will not be happy, Tanya, to have ended up in this position. A higher Pisan. It's a position that he needs to be on the defense for the most part. All these ideas really nicely explain the problems that uh, Magnus has to counter. And it's always very difficult for, once again, the side uh, that is fighting for the defense to switch from defending one side of the board to the other flank of the board. Uh, for Ali Reza, he can enjoy his position for now. I'm looking at their heart weight monitor. Uh, not, and Ali Reza doesn't look so tense. On the camera, also at about 100. Uh, so feeling pretty good about things right now. Yes, he has all the reasons to be happy. The, the reason why he is probably a bit nervous is that he feels that this is a very critical moment. Yeah, okay, let's just give two, three tempi for black and black most probably will neutralize the pressure, yeah? So this is very much about uh, a position where, of course, you have to make the right choice, yeah? And now he has this choice between rook c3 and rook a3, yeah? Again, we are talking about two similarly strong moves and he goes for the move rook a3, which Nicholas highlighted as probably being even more precise than rook c3, following computer precision there, 
uh, now we understand why Arizona's heart rate is kind of more or less normal because he, he simply controls everything so nicely. And that knight on c1, which hasn't de developed so far, actually finds a beautiful spot in the position to eventually jump to. Before that, it's allowed its colleague, the rook, to come into the attack. a6 pawn always hanging. Uh, the bishop from d1 will also find its place eventually. We might see the c pawn advancing up the board. So a really difficult spot for Magnus. And very often, we think about Ali Reza as being this... You know, this super classy creative player when it comes to middle game, when it comes to tactics, when it comes to attack. But he's also so good at end games. How many times have we seen him convert positions with the most minuscule of advantages? Uh, Peter, and so far his end game technique has been impressive here. Yes, but I'm always amused, yeah, when, uh, when we are talking about one of the very best players in the world, uh, super talent, geniuses and so on, and then we think about them that, yes, they are great tacticians, yes, they have this characteristic that they like to attack and uh, they, they are brilliant, but in order to be one of the best in the world, you have to be universal, yeah, it, uh, if you are not good at endgame or you are not good mm. at exploiting small advantages, then no matter what kind of attacker you are, you will never be in the top 10 or even he was number two with 28 plus at the age of 19 already. So, uh, yeah, Alidade is something very special. His skills are amazing and he's clearly enjoying. Now, Magnus had played the move Bishop B7, which again was the best move uh, by the computer, Magnus making sure that he has to put up perfect defense. Yeah, just one more inaccuracy, just one slight inaccuracy, and he knows it can be all over. So he is very much focused. And so far, I haven't really, there was a jump on heart rate to 90. Now it's down to 84. But if Magnus was right at the receiving end from the beginning, but his heart rate was between 60, 70, it looked like to me, wow, yeah, Magnus is so calm but uh, he's also showing some sign of nervousness. And look at this, Ali Reza first puts the pressure on the a6 pawn. Now that Magnus has put the bishop on b7, he starts targeting the c7 pawn, making it more uncomfortable for Magnus to make the move c6, because then you're kind of just blocking your own bishop on b7. Once again, these little incremental increases in the end game is what gets eventually the job done. It's still a lot of technique that needs to be shown. And to your point, Peter, that you just made about how to be the best in the world, you need to be the best in all different kinds of positions. Position. You have to have this universal aspect of play. But that said, I've always felt that these uh, top players and every chess player has intuitively this instinctive style which makes them take these certain decisions and positions and that's where the stylistic aspect comes into play. Exactly, yeah, it's very important. Yeah, For example, if there is a choice for Ali Reza to go for the attack, like he did not take that pawn, yeah? Magnus sacrificed that pawn already, move three. Yeah, he said, no, thank you very much. I want to keep the initiative. Yeah, he went for f4. Yeah, this was very much collected. But now he gets the chance to transform into a nice endgame. And then he didn't capture on f4. He waited exactly. after he takes f4. Yeah, and then he is doing all these kind of things. This magic uh, Nicholas was showing <laughs> with the computer that this is clinical precision. You know, you go first rook a3, then you go rook c3, then knight b3 is coming because knight c5 will be a tempo. Magnus retreating his knight to it. Of course, a human and especially a player like Magnus, yeah, who has this, this, uh, he feels every single essence of every position. He does not want to play c6. He will never play c6. How can I close that bishop? He wants to keep the structure somehow open, maybe also somewhere hoping for some break with f7, f5, create some counterplay. He has to look for counterplay. He has to look for a way to change the dynamics of the position, f5, Definitely in the air. I'm also looking at the clocks uh, that we've got in front of us. Now this, even though the queens have been traded off, there are still a lot of pieces on the board. It feels like a queenless middle game with both the major pieces, both, the, both sets of rooks on the board. Lots of pawns, lots of pawn breaks that are going to come up. And the players are just on move number 14. There's a good amount of moves to be made to make time control. Nicholas, what do you think? How much of a factor are, are the clocks going to be in this one? Well, it's definitely a position that is much easier to play for Ali Reza right now. As already Peter highlighted as well, the knight can come to b3, the bishop can come to f3. So this all looks very natural now. Knight to b3, potentially landing on c5 or maybe on a5. And the bishop can go to f3 next. d4 is in the air to push the rook away and gain some more control over the center. And it is quite an uncomfortable position for Magnus. So... 
this is a very important aspect. If the position is easier to play, you can play a bit more quicker and your opponent has to burn more time on the clock to defend. So not only is Magnus behind objectively, he also has a more difficult position to play. And this means Friuse has very good chances to, to win this one. I would like to go to another game where also Black is under a lot of pressure. We've seen it already several times. And it's the game between Vincent Keimer and Levon Aronian. This position is on the board with G4 being played and Aronian has a choice between different difficult moves here. So we were looking at knight h6, we really didn't like it. I was analyzing the move h6, which is also an option to play a counterattack on a knight, but this one is also not very attractive for black. There is the move knight takes e6 checked now. So instead of taking the knight immediately, allowing black to take and open up the rook, first we sacrifice the knight on e6 and then take this knight on f5. The rook is lined up against the king. e takes f5 makes sense. Now the rook is coming out. Rook takes f5 check, put the king on g8. And here already white can start a very dangerous attack by going bishop h5 and asking some questions to the queen. And here I was looking at a line like bishop b5 check, king g2 and now g6, which seems to win a piece, but this is not going to work out. White has a very nice move, rook g1 now to line up here on the g file. And the attack is, is tremendous. For example, g takes h5 now, king h1 check, and this is already checkmate. Oh, there's a beautiful yeah, finish queen b1, here. Queen b1, yeah? Queen b1, or first starting with rook f7. Wow. Rook f7 check, clearing the way, queen takes f7 now. Queen b1 check, and black can throw some pieces in the way, the bishop and the queen, but it will not change the fact that this king will be checkmated. So these are some potential lines that both of these players are looking at. And in this position, did we see a move? Yes, he played bishop b5 check, but this is really not changing too much. However, well, it's changing the fact the king cannot go to g2. So it makes a lot of sense to to play this check at this time because here there is the fork on h4 and you cannot allow that. So that means Vincent has a choice between either king g1 or bishop e2. From a human perspective, I would, I'm not sure. I would like to keep the light squares bishops on the board, but placing the king on g1 also looks a little bit awkward. Still maybe king g1 the way to go. And then you're left with the same question, even though maybe here now, as a difference, you have the option queen e7 to attack the knight on, on, in this way. And after g takes f5, there would be a check. This is the difference that the check was was inserted, and this would be this would be fine for black. So decisions to be made for Vincent here after bishop b5 check a move he certainly had to um, consider before going g4. He is still in good shape after both bishop e2 and king g1, but he has to find a decision. But we can see the time. Aronian has invested a lot of time. This is good news for Vincent, Peter. Yeah, and I know Vincent uh, quite well. <laughs> yes, in, in all those <laughs> seven years. And his body language after bishop b5 check signals to me that he is very much into calculating the direct bishop e2 move because uh, it's kind of a counterintuitive move. We don't want to trade the light squared bishops because we hope that this light squared bishop can be useful in the attack. But if you would not be considering bishop e2, you would be just blitzing out your king g1 move a tempo, yeah? So he is really into some very deep calculation after I'm trying to figure out, I haven't been yet thinking, I was following what Nicholas was saying, that what's happening after bishop e2, what kind of tactical possibilities are in the position? Because one thing we have to highlight, that after bishop takes e2, white could take queen takes e2, and all of a sudden, both of black's knights would be attacked at the same time. So bishop takes e2 check would lose on the spot. This brings us to the moment that black has to find the move. And what is black's move? Do we go now back with the knight to h6 because we already claim that we are able to trade the light squared bishops? Yeah. Is there some tactical shot with knight takes e6 check? 
Yeah, after 9h6, this is kind of the first move that I was thinking because of looking at Vincent, yeah? I see his heart rate, I know exactly what he is thinking about. So knight e6 check, queen takes e6, bishop takes b5, for example, is looking really good. Yes, we might sacrifice the g4 pawn, but the light squares and the two bishops should be very powerful here. But one thing we should never forget, that king, and this is, this is the, the free statue, this is the Fisher and Dom essence, yeah, that we can be fooled. It looks like it was a French defense where black has already lost the right to castle with king f8. But this king can still suddenly castle short or even long, depending on the situation. Yeah, and the castling option would be there in all these positions. Meanwhile, we do have a move here, and he did, you do know Vincent very well. Peter, great call on that one, uh, your protege, and uh, I would love to hear, what, because I, I think I saw you at breakfast as well, uh, you were having a chat with him, what, what was your advice for him starting this knockout phase? Because he had a really good run in the round robin. Yes, uh, luckily I could, I can even reveal what I told him, okay, just keep on going what was, <laughs> what was working so far, just don't change, yeah, we, we talked about Dingley then situation, yeah, there the advice would definitely to change something, yeah, because yeah. it's not going good, you have to change things, but if it goes well, then okay, you, you just stick to it, and you should be always in your comfort zone, yeah? Invest as much time as you feel like. Clearly, it's a new time control, yeah? Uh, Vincent, we see that he invests a lot of time, plays quality chess. It might actually come back to hunt him, yeah? That we are praising his decisions are good. Finally, maybe in the time trouble, he will make one mistake which cost him the game. We, we just never know this. Uh, but it's kind of nice to see him play great chess. G takes F5 played. Yes, and I think we're just uh, getting the moves in now. And let me just, after bishop b5, indeed bishop e2 on the board. And like you pointed out, the bishop... And chat, we're back. We apologize uh, for uh, for those technical issues, but it's all been restored and the action is indeed heating up. And we're going to jump straight into where we left it. And it was in this position that Winston did intercept the check with Bishop E2, Peter. And there were so many tactical ideas, skirmishes that we were looking at. Break it down for us. Yes, we got carried away. I was showing brilliant ideas. We were together coming up with incredible ideas, storylines, everything. And then we realized that no, actually we are stuck. Uh, so let's go through it. Once again, Bishop E2, H6. Clever move, yeah, black targets that night on G5. Vincent goes on with his plan, g takes f5, h takes g5, f takes c6, and the one defense that I was shouting out that yes, we know already that castle is possible, that well, maybe here castle is the great defense because the black rook protects the f7 pawn, and then all of a sudden Tanya and Nicholas, you both shouted out that e7 wins, right, e7 wins, that's a stunner. Because again, the same motive that we were discussing after bishop takes e2, queen takes e2, the knight on a6 will be hanging. The, let's just put it on the board to appreciate it. Now white is setting e takes f8, so black has to take the pawn and then white picks up the knight and wins the game. However, uh, clearly uh, Levon had been foreseeing all this and he is an incredible maestro and he comes up with a triple exclamation mark defensive move, rook b8 to b7. This is just insane, yeah? Uh, the rook protects on f7, and all of a sudden those pieces like the bishop on a8, rook b8 that we highlighted out five, six moves ago that those are not in the game, they are very much participating. And what a turn of events. Is white still better? Uh, how do we evaluate this? Because black is kind of protecting the king side and white is still also stuck with the bishop on a1. And this is what we were talking about, Levon Aronian, he is so resourceful and he's he's got this artistic style of play, his creativity and that's what we see right now with this small rook move, rook to b7, uh, defending it all, that rook on h8 might just be the most active piece in the position and we see it show on the player's heart 
rates as well. Vincent touching the 120 because he can feel the pressure. It's very possible that Vincent missed this resource. Yes. Rook to b7 is such an easy move to miss. Uh, Nicholas, you're checking out some lines. Take us through this position. How can Vincent continue the pressure? Yeah, first of all, it has to be said that the last sequence by Ronian was absolutely masterful. Starting with the move bishop b5, and I think he already foresaw foresaw everything from here. Starting with bishop b5 check, first learn the bishop to e2, now this move h6 to hit the knight, and now in this position it is really an only move to go rook b7, but with the light squared bishops being traded and only this bishop remaining, which is not really in the game, they, the, the bad knight and the bad bishop, they both compensate each other, or they both it's uh, sorted out. They're both equally bad in a way. And he's back in the game, objectively. Still, there is an advantage for Vincent, but it feels like a position is definitely more difficult to play. Now, the computer suggests a move like h4, which I don't really understand. So, castle seems to make some sense to me, even though the rook is not really placed better on f1 than before. And... Now, but at least the king is a bit safer and you protect the pawn on h2. Black can still not take on e6. Maybe black also plays castle. And now we could look at bishop takes b5, queen takes b5. And somehow still trying to start an attack here against the king. Maybe move the queen over to c1 to hit the pawn on g5. But you can already tell, even with me having the engine on here, it feels difficult to find a clear way forward and it must be even more difficult with, for Vincent. And let's not forget, he's 20 minutes down on the clock. He's not getting Oof. any increment before move 40 when he will also get another half an hour. But this is 20 moves away. So right now, he has about one minute per move. And that's not a lot of time. I'm getting worried for Vincent. Yes, Peter. me too. Me too. And also one thing that I see and I know Vincent as, as a strategist, position, very fine positional player, he understands very much that in this structure that knight on a6 has much more prospects because if we just trade something on f7, just to illustrate uh, the, the point I'm trying to make, takes, takes, rook takes f7, king takes f7 and potentially black is playing knight c7, knight e6 and black will be strategically winning. Yeah, the, suddenly we are talking about winning position. These double pawns are also fantastic. The f4 square, everything is guarded. The black knight will be dominating the, the dark square white bishop. Uh, the, the light squares, everything. So uh, clearly he takes f7 is not a move to, to play. But on the other hand, what do we do? What do we do? Because just keeping that pawn on e6, yeah, this is like a very special kind of, it's, it's the essence of the position. Because as long as we don't take on f7, Black is unable to play knight c7 because the rook has to protect the f7 pawn. This is the, the good news. And uh, Vincent's clock is ticking down 19 minutes for more than 20 moves. No increment. And one has to say that, for example, for me, playing a time trouble phase as an old guard is natural because all my life in my youth I was used to this. And actually getting the extra seconds is sometimes disturbing me. But the younger generation is so much relying on this. Just give me two seconds and I'm feeling calm. Mm. If you give me 30 seconds but I don't have increment, I'm getting very nervous. I know the young generation. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a dramatic situation now. And it's exactly moves like rook to b7 that throws a player off. Psychologically, you feel you're in control. You placed your pieces. You almost feel like you're getting this job done. It's a matter of moves when you're able to arrive to the exact conclusion that you want here. But then rook b7, a defense out of nowhere comes on the board. And it's a full game. F7 is defended. That rook on H8 that we've been pointing out is in the play because it stops a very key idea of white to get this rook into the attack. It doesn't even need to castle anymore to come into the game. With everything defended and the long-term potential of this knight that you pointed out and white's bishop still far away from the game, we could be seeing a potential turnaround in this one. Vincent now coming down to 17 minutes on the clock for Levon. He's played fast. He's kept it under control. We had him in the confession booth. He wasn't happy with his position earlier, but we think that's about to change now. We will take this moment to zoom out and get a quick update on our other boards. Let's bring up our bird's eye view. Now, because of all the action, there's one game that we haven't been able to look at in detail, uh, and that is the third board that we see from the left. 
Fabiano Caruana against Gukesh. And I think it's a good time to jump in because that last move by Fabi, to me, it looks like a pawn sacrifice to open up that bishop on a1. Fabi did not want to allow Gukesh's knight to jump into that center of the board on d5 and have a blocked bishop on a1. Uh, White's knight also finding potential squares in the center. This might be exploding. Let's do a quick deep, deep dive into this, Nicholas. Maybe you can back up and take it quickly from the top and tell us what's going on here. Yeah, we only had a brief look at this game so far and the last time we left it was when there was a lot of tension in the position, I believe around, maybe around here. And we see this tension here on the queen side and it really resembles a lot a uh, normal uh, standard chess game where some somewhat of a reverse French, you could say, for example, a position that can also arise out of the English often. And now, finally, the tension was alleviated here. And black has this really nice square on d5 for his pieces. And this bishop, it's like a sleeping giant so far. It is blocked by the pawn on d4. And what we're going to see is that will change very soon, as in the current position, Fabiano sacrificed the pawn. So here we see bishop b3, bishop d5. It's all about this, this square and blocking the the white pieces and here a very drastic measure by Fabiano. He played the move f4, certainly not a move he was happy to play, but he was probably afraid about the attacking prospects of black against the white king. f4, quite an ugly move to play because you weaken further the, the squares and you also limit yourself in how you can lever the, the pawn on e4. And rook c8 makes sense to go on the open c file. Knight e7, rook b3, let's get up to speed here, queen e6. Now black is ready to put a knight on d5 and you see another drawback of the move f4 that the pawn on e3 is quite weak and a knight on d5 or a knight on f5, they both target this, this, this pawn. And here Fabiano played what is probably a very good practical decision, sacrificing a pawn but opening up the sleeping giant in the corner, the bishop with a1, which is pointing right towards the black king. Knight took on d5 and now certainly the idea of Fabiano was to play knight d4. He has already done that. We see another advantage of giving up this pawn which was in the way giving a square for the knight on d4 hitting the queen on e6. The queen drops back and this is the current position. White has definitely some compensation for the sacrificed pawn. There's also a square on c6 for the knight. There's a potential square on f5 for the knight. The queen can come to g3. However, black's position is quite stable. And if he can maybe consolidate further, maybe trade some pieces, he's up a pawn. So Gukesh objectively better, but practically I think Fabiano is quite happy that he was able to sacrifice his pawn and open up his pieces a bit, Peter. Yeah. Absolutely agreed. Uh, it was all about the d5 square and uh, it, it goes on to show that this was also the almost the only, yeah, it was the only game where Black has solved his opening problems right at the at the very beginning when he pushed this e4 on move 7 and then followed it up correctly with, with d6, d5. Ever since, I think Black was kind of enjoying the position. But uh, look at the clock situation. Yeah, and in every single game, and let me also, we, we haven't talked about one thing, there was a press conference before a tournament here with Magnus Carson, and Magnus was highlighting this, he already sensed it, that, you know what, there is no increment all the way till up to move 40, so we're gonna be seeing some crazy time scrambles, and Magnus said yes, and I'm up for it, yeah, he's really looking forward to it, but uh, it depends very much in which position, which type of position you reach that time control, mm -hmm. yeah, because if you have the initiative, things are easily coming to you, then then it's of course very nice, it's it's great, but if you are at the receiving end and you have to find only moves with a couple of seconds, then then of course the, the time trouble can be deadly. To be precise, he called it a sadistic idea, yes. to not have an uh, increment. I kind of agree with that. It's a lot of fun, a lot of entertainment for us as chess fans to watch happen with the players with little time on the clock. But oh my God, the tension and the nerves with no seconds to count on to gain, no increment on the clock and the positions just starting to get to their critical moments, some critical questions to be answered. Uh, 
I don't know how much the players actually enjoy that. But we're in for quite a wild ride once we do reach those time controls. Uh, 40 moves, until 40 moves, there's no increment. It's only after that when the players get an additional 30 minutes on the clock for the rest of the game that there's also a 30 second increment in the format. And there we have it. Uh, it is a best of two mini match in the knockout phase between the players. In case that ends in a 1-1 one, one tie, we will have two rapid games. 15 minutes with a 10 second increment. If that's a tie, as well we might have blitz we might even have an armageddon in freestyle chess that's something that i haven't seen before and that would be the true sadistic pleasure to watch that happen peter it will be absolute chaos on the board but let's bring up let's go back to the action and bring up our bird's eye view and there we have it the four current positions and we see it's that second board from the left where it's still chaos on the board finally Levon did decide to go castle in that one. Things are under control. The pawn was sacrificed again on e6. And we see the ideas of e7 and the tactics we were pointing out earlier do not work right now because of that little move, the rook lift that we had with Black's rook jumping on to b7. So things under control on that board. Meanwhile, on that extreme left board, not a back. Abdul Satrov seems to have gained in advantage. It's an opposite color bishop, but still an extra pawn for not a back. And he's the one who's putting pressure on all of Black's pawns. And in fact, there is one pawn hanging, the b5 pawn, the f5 pawn. There's a lot of tension in that one. But Peter, I suggest that we rush over to our extreme right board and get an update on our marquee matchup. Ali Reza Firuja with the white pieces. Last time we left, he was in driver's seat. Magnus Carlsen under pressure. He's trying to put on the pressure on the E5. Let's do a deep dive into that one. Ali Reza has managed to win a pawn, an extra pawn for white. I do see a lot of peace activity. Is this enough compensation for Magnus? Well, I don't know if it's enough or not, but at least he managed to change the character of the game. Yeah? And whenever you are on the defensive, whenever the situation is critical, then doing something that confuses your opponent and creates counterplay or the impression that you get counterplay, that's very important. Let's just very quickly uh, go to the position that we left with knight e8. I'm going to go very quickly through the moves. So knight b3, the knight is ready to jump to c5. Castles, Magnus solves at least the problem with his king. Knight c5, bishop c8, rook a3, white goes after the pawn. That pawn is falling, so Magnus needs to get ready to open up the center. So white takes that pawn. Um, what was wrong with... Okay, so he took the pawn. No, I was thinking about d4 there, but perhaps no need to uh, push Peter, carry on, sorry. Yeah, he decided to, to pick up the pawn and Magnus goes d7, d5. That was the point of his play, activating the knight, breaking the, uh, the structure, opening up the e5 for potential counterplay. E takes d5, knight takes d5, a3 protecting the b4 pawn. We already talked about this in the nodier back Dingridan position. Also, the knight from d5 was eyeing on the pawn on b4. Knight e3 forking the rook and the bishop. So there's no other move than to play rook e1. And because now the rook on e5 is pinned, black reinforces that rook with rook f8, keeping the tension. My intuition actually tells me that black probably should have enough mm. compensation to make a draw. But, uh, for example, looking at the evolution bar, it clearly signals that apparently white has some very precise way of maintaining the advantage. But the point what I'm trying to make that if we can play knight takes d1 and we force uh, white to take with the rook and we invade with the rook to e2, often we can end up giving up even many, many pawns when we are activating also the other rook going for counterplay, yeah? So I feel like Magnus has good chances. And I want to highlight that line that you're pointing out because uh, one of the natural moves in this position would be, as you're pointing with your arrows, rook to c6. I want to put pressure on that c7 pawn. I'm also defending the c2 pawn. And I think it's time for black to now pick up the bishop because if you don't, for example, move like rook e7, white keeps the bishops on the board and that just makes white's task easier. So knight takes bishop, Rook takes knight. And yes, there is a line with defense with rook to e7. And, you know, you can go into a passive defense. But, Peter, your idea as well. It's always in the air. And I don't know if it works or not, rook e2, to give up the pawn. But it's something that white has to watch out for and think about here. Yes, I would very much love to. And I'm a big fan of it. But there is one problem, yeah? And this is, the, this is what the players who are playing the game are faced with, yeah? That, yes, we want to get this. But actually, there is this rook c5 defense. 
No, so rook, ah, rook c5, c5 simply, yes. rook c5 disturbs me enormously, yeah, because, okay, this rook takes c5, b takes c5, rook takes c2, I don't know how bad it is, but it's certainly not good. We are terrified by such pawns. And there we have it. What happened? Yeah, rook c6 on the, on the board. board. We're going to be seeing all this action. Yeah, and I was also wanting to point out one more defense, which was that maybe if in that line, it's not so easy for black to get that ideal construction because that rook on the second rank doesn't have too many squares. After rook e5, maybe king f1, and you still manage to kind of not allow black the second rank ideas. Yes, and this is now on the board. Knight takes d1, Ooh, rook takes d1. This. And now it's the question. Yeah, black has many moves. Black can also try to go rook f5, rook e2, but I did not like it because white will have some rook f1 ideas at the right time. On the other hand, rook f1 maybe can be met by rook g5, and we are hoping for some rook f2, rook e1 check, rook f1, mm. rook e2 kind of <laughs> shuffle. Uh, but this is, I feel like it's more like wishful thinking. There will always be something for white. Magnus, yeah, look at Magnus. Is he believing? What are you reading from his his face expression, is he believing that uh, there should be enough counter play? Probably the hardest player to beat on the planet, regardless of what the position is. He's looking for ways to defend this. And Nicholas, we're trying to find active ways for Black to play here. We're not able to do so, as we saw in the lines, uh, where if Black does try to get that Rook activity, to us it doesn't feel like it could be successful. Do you think it's time for Magnus to go passive and defend with uh, the Rook to E7? Well, he needs to. There's no active way to go forward. You cannot just give another pawn on c7, that would be already two pawns down, so he needs to play rook e7. And honestly, it's not so obvious how white is going to make progress, because yes, you have four pawns against two pawns here on the queen side, but these pawns, to get them rolling, to get them move up the board and create pass pawns, is not easy to accomplish. So while white ha is having a clear advantage here, he has to play slow. The computer says maybe play king f1 or maybe play rook d2. Rook d2 makes a lot of sense because you take care of the second rank and all the active ideas that Tanya and Peter were discussing are directly related to some counterplay on the second rank. However, still afterwards, you have to answer the question, how are you going to make progress? Maybe eventually play c4 and honestly, I don't see so much counterplay for black right now. Yes, you have the two rooks. Yes, white has to be careful, but Ali Reza must be a clear favorite to win this position. And he has been, honestly, he has been in excellent shape throughout this entire game. I've been really, really impressed with his play. And this is actually the current position, rook 87. And now Firuza has different options. Rook d2 makes sense. Maybe h3 also makes a lot of sense. He has to slowly improve his position. He's up a palm. He has the potential to create strong pass pawns on the queen side. If, if he can do so, he has huge chances to win this game and take a lead in this mini-match against Magnus Carlsen. It's uh, such a critical position and such a dream position for Firuja. Almost feels like you're playing for two results. And that is the dream scenario when you're playing against Magnus Carlsen. But right now, it looks like Nodebek Abdusatrov also has a dream position and it's against the world champion Ding Liren. I saw the eval bar there at the bottom of our screen. Nodebek, we've been saying he's been up on the material count, up upon played an incredibly strong opening, getting that knight h3 idea in. Uh, Peter, it, if you look at the evaluation bar, it says that Nordebeck is close to winning. Yeah, Do you and, agree with it? Yeah, and he just came back to the board and blitzed out the move rook g1. Uh, Dingrian is trying to deflect that rook by pushing d2 because, okay, the g7 pawn is hanging. Yeah, black's king is in a lot of trouble. I believe most probably white even has the chance of eventually simply going rook d3. Let's start with a check on g7. Yes, then. you can start, but okay, at least then this rook is not invading to e7 immediately, uh, but the position is, is kind of winning. And Abdul Satov is just playing such fantastic chess yeah. throughout the event, not just this game. Yeah, <laughs> He has been demolishing this stunning field in the rapid portion, and uh, Ding is suffering. Look at this. Abdul Satov is about to make a move. He's reaching out. Which rook? Will he go for rook d3, or will he get greedy with that g7 pawn, jump in with a check, and then stop uh, black's d pawn from queening? Uh, and he's got 15 minutes on the clock. He does go for rook takes pawn, comes in with a check. King to h8, only move by Ding. Head in hands for Ding. We've been talking about a comeback uh, by Ding in this classical format. Peter, it was so important for him to get this first round 
in his favor, in control, at least to stop the bleeding from what had happened in the rapid round robin format, this is going to hurt. Yes, certainly. And there is also one more thing we did not mention that according to regulation, which was agreed in the players meeting, that whoever finished on the top of the round robin section had the right to select the color for the first game in the mini matches. And all the four players who finished on top four chose white. Yeah, they felt like, okay, we are in great shape. We have to immediately start attacking the opponent. We cannot uh, pass the initiative to, the, to them. And we see Abdul Satulov, Vincent, Caruana, and also Alreza choosing the white pieces. Feels like a strategy that has worked for most of them right now. Feeling the rhythm of uh, freestyle chess, wanting to come in, wanting to push for more. And that's what Nordebeck is doing right now. For the moment, Dinglerin stops the infiltration of that rook two on the seventh rank, plants the bishop on d5, gives the opportunity for white to actually pick up that d2 pawn. You're pointing the move after rook takes d2. Dinglerin is relying on threats of rook to f4, attacking the f6 pawn and the f3 pawn. Uh, do we see something better than rook takes pawn here for Noderbeck? Well, there are many different uh, moves. I'm pretty sure that there should be some merciless move in the position, but uh, one has to look, look at things. Also, let's not forget about some kind of a defensive resource from the black side, like rook g8. Yeah, well, if, for example, white plays the move king g3, saying that, you know what, if black wants to play rook f4, then why don't I just play king g3? But it can be met by rook g8, and we don't want to trade those pieces. Peter, I just want to point out an idea, and I, uh, more for the concept rather than the accuracy of it, to just show an interesting uh, point in this position of opposite color bishops and how we can actually make the king a target in these positions. Because of these different color complexes, it's hard to fight your opponent's bishop. The move bishop to d4 is what I want to bring on. I want to line up my bishop against your king. And what first phased me from this move was a black's resource of rook takes pawn on a3. But I have an idea that I want to show. Now, yes, I can't take your rook because d1 would be a queen. But can white actually go f7 here? And I'm not sure what's happening, but I do see our eval bar not reacting, so the tactics might be working out. And now give a check on g8, a double check. King to h8 is, is the only move. And here's when I was and trying to find the difference, the mm. defense. But if you take, yes, and it works out because you just take on c8. If rook takes d4, white queens first. No, oh, yeah. no if rook takes eight. bishop, white queens first. But if black queens, then you give checkmate. Yes, yes. So rook h8 is, uh, is threatening. Uh, but but honestly, after bishop d4, I always want to rely on rook takes d4. Yeah, I don't want to take that <laughs> yeah, pawn on a3. Killing my party right now. <laughs> okay, I have to defend. I have to try to defend. So yes, this is a stunning, stunning line. But let me try to tell you what was my concern with bishop d4. That maybe black plays the move like rook f8, and try to set up a defense with rook f7. Yeah, I don't want to let but him. But I go f7. And then I take rook d and rook, rook g8. g8. Okay, <laughs> then then uh, then then it's kind of. Tempting, but you have to calculate it very carefully because just one mistake would spoil everything. Rook g8 check. How does it continue? Can I play king h7? I certainly don't want to take because if take, take, and then takes, then white just picks up the d2 pawn. So yes, we have to go for some sharp line king h7. Rook takes f8. Rook takes d3. Rook h8 check. And this should and be queen winning f5 because... queen f5 in yeah, the end. And exactly. you pick up the rook on d3. Exactly. Yes. Queen of six. Yeah. Yes. yes. Exactly. So this is the point that we are oh. hitting the king and the rook at the same time, and we are also guarding the pawn. A lot of calculations. All right. I All want Nadi back to go bishop d4 now, Peter. Well, I, I want it on the board. It's <laughs> I'm excited now. Okay. It's very much in the spirit. So he's taking his time. He's done to 11 minutes. What is the heart rate? 85. Wow. It seems like Abdul Sattu is extremely hmm. cool. Yeah, and, and Ding Liren, who feels like, wow, there are so many mating ideas around my king. He, he, he had like 105, and he's there we go. Out. He's reaching Yeah, and it seems like he's reaching out for the bishop on c5. I, I could somehow sense from his movement, it's going to be bishop d4. I thought you were giving me a fist bump for that move, Peter. Well, if it happens on the... Let's wait. Let's Come don't on, jinx do it. it. Let's don't jinx it yet. <laughs> I'm just going to be hanging in here. <laughs> like in bowling, yeah, after... <laughs> Oh, and I'll just have to take my hand right back. 
Come Please. on, not. Oh, it's on the there door, Peter. <laughs> Bravo. Saved you, Tanya. Saved you. Not a bag saves the day. Bishop D4. But I mean, this is the move you want to make, right? In an opposite color bishop ending. Black's king trapped in the corner. I was not sure about rook takes pawn on a3, but the line seemed to work out after f7, rook g8. And it looks like this might just be game over in just a couple of moves now. Yes, this, this f7, rook takes d4, rook g8 check is kind of a key idea. The well, d2 pawn is not doing it. Yes, Nicholas? There yeah. is still one idea that I want to highlight, uh, which is important. There's the move bishop takes f3, potentially, I believe. But it should not work out in the end. Uh, the idea is bishop takes f3. Uh, so now you have to be careful, because if you play king takes f3, then there's rook takes a3. Oh, oh my goodness, wow. that would be... And black wins. Black wins because the rook is deflected from Ow. defending the promotion square. And f7 so rook is, takes rook is a check. This and time it is difference. a check and then I take the bishop on d4 next and that's it. So bishop takes f3. On the board. Is on the board after the turf, <laughs> but I'm sure he calculated this. So he needs to play rook takes d2 now. He needs to play rook takes d2, but it's also not a very difficult move. You just get rid of this powerful pawn. Is it the and, only But move look at this, he's moving up on his chair. Is he... Wow, look at this. Oh, maybe he missed it. Maybe, maybe he missed he it. But it. he's lucky that the, the position is still winning. Is it the only move, though? It is, is the only move. Oh, wow. But it also makes a lot of sense because you have yeah. to defend against d1 queen. Okay, maybe there's something like rook c7, but let's not and think the, about that. Nicholas, the problem with f7 is that you just take the bishop on d4, yeah? Yes, and now there is d1, d1 queen. d1 in the end. Yes. Yeah, there's exactly. Rook takes d4, eliminating the strong bishop. And then there's d1 queen and black is up a piece. So if the bishop takes f3, he needs to take the pawn. But now he keeps all the threats in the possession without having to worry about the past d pawn. So for example, yeah, well, after any move now, f7 will happen. For example, bishop takes h5, f7. And now in this line, this is the same motive that we already saw. Rook takes d4. There is the intermediate check. Rook g8, black takes, white takes. King takes, and we end up in this position, which is completely winning because white, white has this passed pawn on the A file, and black can just resign. So if he does find rook takes d2, which he will, I'm very, very sure, then f7, you can almost pre-move, and he should win this game. But nice final trick by Ding. But look at this oh also. I want to highlight one thing, that if we look at the camera, it seems like Nodivak is so nervous. Yeah, but look at his so heart rate, and he takes rook d2. He and finds it's, it. And it's only 77 to 80. Wow, wow. Yeah, and he was so fidgety and shifty. I think he missed bishop takes f3. He missed that move, but then he sits down to calculate. He knows that he just has to be precise, and he finds the line. Nodivak is a calculation beast. Ding goes for bishop takes h5. Uh, the idea, the line that uh, Nicholas was pointing out will appear after the move f7. Nodivak is such a beast, Peter. Yeah, no, you, you cannot allow him to get the upper hand. That's the, that's the point. Yeah, if he gets the upper hand, he is not this player who trembles when he gets a chance. Look at his body language. It's so, it's so confident and it, is, it can be really intimidating to be playing against uh, Nordebeck. He's just, he's got that killer focus. Absolutely. He's about to deliver the killer blow. Yes, <laughs> yes, he's about to play f7. Just double checking correctly, he still has uh, more than eight minutes, yeah? This is not uh, serious because he knows if f7 works, it's game over, yeah? That's it, finish. And it's good that he's paused. I think this is very instructive. You're close to those final moves that you need to make, but you just want to be precise. You know the job is done once you get, you get this moment absolutely right. And to my mind, Nordbeck will not falter. No, for sure not. Okay, if you already played bishop d5 and rook takes d2, there. No, he goes bishop mm. e5. Okay, it doesn't. He, he ju and rook g4 blitzed out. Bishop e5 is also winning. Did he blitz out or he moved back? Ding, oh. ding. Did not. What happened there? He, he moved the rook to g4, but he didn't let it go, so he put it back on a4. I think that's what happened, but we, we did not have the, the right. Angle. Yeah, because rook g4, you just trade f7, bishop d6. Isn't that game over? Yes, yes. absolutely. That's it. And Nodebeck can right now just trade on g4. We'll just show it quickly with the arrows, the simplest to our eyes. You trade. It's a forcing sequence of moves. 
go in with the check, only square, defend this f8 square with that bishop to d6, bring in the power, and black will end up losing big material. Yes, it's, it's game over. One highlight is also that I think it never ever happened before that Fisher and Dom chess, uh, freestyle chess, had been recorded. The players are writing their score sheets. Yeah, it's, it's just such an incredible uh, moment. I'm, I'm just enjoying it, especially the, those first moves, which are not natural, should be very special for them. All eyes on Nodir back. I'm pretty sure that, yeah, he, he knows that, okay. Let, let just take the time. I have all these F7 ideas. What is the best way? And what move that. number are we on? Yeah, move 33. Doesn't matter. Just seven moves to yeah. make. And you're going to end up in just a couple of moves winning big material. The arrows that are pointing the line wins the exchange and the game with it. Yeah. We still have the A3 pawn, yeah? The, that, Very important. That pawn <laughs> simply queens, yeah? You just, with the, the king far away on the king side, there is no power to stop that pawn. Yeah, and the, the point that Peter's making is that after Nordebeck takes on g4, it's recaptured, f7 check, king h7, bishop d6, black will step with the king to g7, white can, queen, black gives up the rook, it's about to happen, I have no doubts about this, this is the line we'll be seeing, and after the king takes bishop, this start. pawn will decide the game, no stopping it all the way to a8. Exactly. Okay, now the heart rate is slightly moving up. Okay, <laughs> Abdusatov over 90. This is already some, some sensation. Down to 88. Guys, don't get too excited. I'm having it under control. He just did that trademark Nordebeck stare up at Ding right before he's about to go in for his move. I wonder if there are other ideas that he's looking at because this is, of course, a very straightforward line. Uh, which I was expecting him to blitz out. Nicholas, is there something stronger in the position that perhaps we're missing? No. I mean, this is straightforward and strong. Of course, there are other wins. You can move the rook away, you can move it to e7, you can bring the other rook yes. in, you have different options. But this is straightforward and fairly clear. So I'm also a little bit confused why he's taking his time because there's an absolute force sequence and... Here after bishop d6, as you pointed out, king g7 is necessary. And then this position is just winning for, for white. You can also pick up one of the pawns. You can push immediately. I mean, probably he's calculating this, a5, and he's checking bishop c8. But it should be fairly clear that this is, this is winning. And he will also reach move 40 soon. So maybe he's not completely happy with this final line, but... It is very much winning, so I expect him to, to go for it very soon. And look at Dingley and with 120 hard rate. Yeah, he, he just, uh, he knows, he knows that this is, now he needs a miracle. Yeah, just a miracle can help him. Uh, just chess-wise, it's, it's hopelessly lost. And if this was an online game, a disconnection on Nordebeck's side would have saved the day for Ding. But I don't see those miracles happening over the board. <laughs> Nodderbeck is reaching the four-minute mark. Uh, make a move, Nodderbeck. Take that rook on g4. I was looking for some lines that, is there a way that I can somehow spoil it? Yeah, and I find a very intriguing position. Mm -hmm. uh, if white plays, for example, rook dd7, rook takes g7, yeah, he's going for it. What are you doing? He's picking up the G7 rook, but it to me doesn't look like the kind of way you reach out when you're about to trade. Yeah. He doesn't trade. Wow. He goes rook E7. That's crazy. That is just... I'm, I... Okay, he wants to but deliver you know, checkmate. Yeah. He wants to go F7 check uh, and King H7 F8, but Black will put the rook on F8. It it's... was one of those defenses I wanted to highlight as well. It's a big threat, F7. First, I want to point out that rook takes rook just felt like such a straightforward line. But you know, the way he reached out for the rook, it felt like he was not about to take that black rook. Yes, it was obvious that he won't be taking the rook. But wow, yeah, rook e7. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm somehow intuitively seeing that rook f8, I'm trying to set up some blockade on the f7 square yeah, to stop that uh, long diagonal. Clearly, he's intending to double then on the 7th rank with rook dd7 and believes that this is going to be checkmate or it should end the game. Yeah, 
Yeah, it looks like Notterback is not playing for material or a long-term conversion. He just wants to go in for the checkmate. He's going in for the kill. Nicholas, we're going to turn to you. Rookie 7, we thought that the most straightforward way were the trades and the line that we discussed. Uh, does this still keep the advantage? I see that, in fact, the evaluation bar does not move. So, Rookie 7, uh, another way to do this. Yeah, another way to do it. A little bit surprising to us because the other position seemed fairly simplified and a clear win. But, yes, lining up the rooks on the 7th rank is quite strong as well. So, Peter was suggesting rook f8 to stop any f7 check. That makes sense. So, rook dd7. And now, what do you do? Yeah, king g8. It doesn't really matter because in either case, I trade the rooks on g7 and probably, probably uh, Nordebeck came to a conclusion that this is even more convincing because here, once again, he can go f7 and rook g8 is threatened and that's it. Well, there is still the question, what happens after bishop takes f7, though? And it's a great question, because let's point out that a8 square is the other color than the bishop on e5. Yeah, this was the line that I actually was looking at oh, back then. Okay. Yeah, look f7, so... king g8 takes, takes. You get the pawn to a6 against king to c8. This I already calculated. Ah. Yeah, that, and then I'm still thinking that it's winning, because the bishop covers yes. the h2 square and yes. the king marches to c5. So if the king was at a8, this would be a draw, even though white is up a bishop and a pawn, these pawns don't even matter. But here you sooner or later get into Sukhsvang or, well, also white is just going to, don't go into queen. Because the king is not getting to a8, this is a very straightforward win. So maybe this is what, this is what up to the turf was checking and this is then even clearer than the win we were discussing. Rook d7, because here, what else can black do? Maybe rook e8 to try and defend in this manner. Here, rook g7 is the only move that wins. Rook g7, rook takes, rook takes. Now, king h8 is forced. King f8 runs into bishop d6 check. So, king h8. And now, you have to do something about the bishop. So, bishop drops back. Bishop a1, maybe. Still, this feels a little bit more difficult. Well, but it is also winning. Rook a8, you can again play f7, and then black has to give up the bishop, rook takes, and then you also win this position. So maybe it's just a matter, matter of style. In either case, he should be winning. This is the current position with Ding to move. All right, but, you know, with three minutes on the clock and, well, how many moves is that? Five moves to make? Well, it might be still a winning position, but to, to me, it just felt like rook takes rook was just such an easier way to do this. Uh, and we look, we hope that Ding's feeling fine right now. Um, the position, though, still stay, remains very bad for the world champion. We will keep an eye out on this one. Uh, let's jump over to some of the other games as time scrambles are being reached, Peter. Let's bring up our bird's eye view really quickly. Uh, and we see there on the extreme right, Ali Reza is up upon. It's going to be a long grind and we will definitely check in with that in just a few minutes. But let's do a quick deep dive into, not, uh, into Winston Keimer against Levon Aronian as Winston is down to five minutes on the clock. Yes, and uh, it's clear that, let me pull it up, that Levon has solved all his problems. Maybe if someone is better than, I believe, Black, now that uh, Black's knight has reached d6, that this is powerful knight versus uh, bad bishop. Uh, on the other hand, still, Black's king is kind of open. Yeah, that should give white uh, chances to, to hold, hold the game. But with five minutes on the clock, which move are we here? Uh, move... 29. Okay, still 11 moves to be played without increment. The last move had been h2, h3, showing that probably uh, Vincent wants to evacuate his king on h2. One trap we have to mention, that if white plays the move rook e3, he has to watch out for ideas like knight g5, and uh, rook takes e7 runs into a fork with knight f3 check. Levon has made a move, he played rook g7 check, Vincent blitzed out the instant reply king h2. The knight will start to jump because let's also highlight that black screen on from b5 
actually covers the v8 square, so white is unable to do a queen a check. There we go, knight g5 on the board. Rook g3. Blitzed out, so at least uh, the good news for Vincent was that those two moves, kind of stabilizing moves, making sense, he could make them instantly. He is still 5 minutes 20 for 9 moves. Okay, it could, is, it could be draw, but in a timetable that knight. Yeah, that knight can jump around. Yeah, for example, black can just play queen d7, then play knight e oops, uh, pardon me, yeah, queen d7, knight e4, and even after the trade of rooks, yeah, takes then the queen and knight combo against white's king can be extremely dangerous. I'm really worried for Vincent here. Lava Naronian has managed to turn this around and we all know that queen and knight versus queen and bishop can be extremely difficult for the side playing with the open king. It is so much about king safety in this one and even though it is Lavon's king on g8 without any shield in front of it, uh, because of that knight on g5, ideas of the rook eventually going to h7, the open h line and the queen lining up on d7, the attack on the h3 pawn, uh, Vincent will have to be on defense. Also notice how the b6, a5 pawns take away the activity of that white bishop. Pawns are equal. The material balance is there, but the position, it's a game for all three results. Uh, Peter, I'm going to let you decide, but I do believe that the ding game might be ending soon. Uh, we know we're in the last couple of moves. Should we just see how Nordebeck perhaps finishes that and then jump over to the Magnus game? Yeah, yeah, let's, let's take a tour because also Levon is probably enjoying his position. He's taking his time. Nothing yet happened. Yeah, because we have seen, yeah, Ding is also in a state of uh, horror. Yeah, he knows that the position is probably lost. And it's a typical, uh, typical position that if Abdusatov goes on to win in style like this, everyone will be telling, of course, this handling of the position was excellent. If suddenly he ends up not winning, then everybody will blame him. Why didn't he go for the fourth sequence? But that's how uh, chess works. So, okay, Nodir back in perfect control. We can move on because that's nothing happened just, yet. Just one point out, both players with head in hands, similar poses, but very different emotions right now for both of them. Uh, Dingler, and I think he's just coming to terms with the fact that this position has fallen apart for him. And... Uh, He's got about 17 minutes on the clock. We're expecting him to take a bit of time. Let's well, there was, there was a new record, I think, of the tournament because his heart rate jumped to 127 for one second. I think that's cleared the record so far of the tournament. Shows yeah. that how much it means to the player. Yeah, this, He's fighting, he's trying to survive, but uh, Nodir back is putting the pressure. Yeah, and of course, I mean, everyone's a Nordebeck fan, right? It, it, just his chest, the, his style, his personality off the board. But, Peter, really, it's a very difficult moment for Ding, and it's uh, sort of heartbreaking to see this being played out after the round robin, coming into this matchup in the very first game against Nordebeck. And he was in trouble from the very start. It's never like he really got his kind of position. So it's not just the scoreline, it's also the quality of play. Yes, uh, okay, the, like he said, move two was already a mistake. Yeah, he goes for Duke F8, he's going for this. We can see that long line that and yeah, Abdul Satov is going for it. Rook G7 check, he has calculated it. King H8, so he's not taking. But okay, he, you can force Rook H7, King G8, Rook DG7, and you get exactly the same position. And what Peter's pointing out, you give a check and you bring in the other Rook. Uh, but instead, now Nordebeck decides to trade on G4. And he's blitzing out his move, so he's definitely calculated, brings the other rook. He wants to go f7 next and give a check on g8. It looks incredibly strong to me, even this line. It's very similar to what it's we've been talking same. about. It's, it's exactly the same, it's exactly the same. Yes. Now, black goes bishop h5, f7, and we are in this line that I calculated right from the very beginning. And it all goes force, and thanks that we get that pawn, on, pawn to a6 in time against black king on c8. That's the key. Bishop on e5 is beautifully positioned, like a study uh, where everything works for white. Rook g7 played a transposition of the analysis that we were doing, and we might be seeing that end game where eventually white spawn lands on a6, but black's king gets only as far as c8. And very important, maybe we'll just quickly show that what we were talking about, Peter. Yes. Bishop h5. Should I just quickly make the moves uh, as the players are thinking? And this is. The line that we looked at earlier, you trade, and if we just follow it up, if Black's King gets to A8, this is a theoretical draw as 
the square on it is the opposite color of the bishop, but the combination of the bishop and the pawn take away the key squares, and eventually white's king just marches up the board and will force black's king to step away, step in, queen. Yes. That's, uh, that's uh, I even think that uh, Ding does not want to even look at, but his problem is that he doesn't have a move. Yeah, it's uh, bishop e6, f7 seems to be leading to the very same variation. And you can see it on Ding. It's just gone all so wrong for him in this one. Let's bring up our bird's eye view uh, as these last few moves are played out. And Peter, there we have it. Extreme left, we've got the Nodderbeck versus Ding. Meanwhile, on the Winston board, the Rooks have been traded off and we get that pure dynamic of Queen and Knight versus Queen and Bishop. Uh, it is going to be so much about King's safety. But with this last move, F3, Black has to watch out because if you want to keep the Knight alive, you actually allow White's Queen to jump in with Queen E7. Well, I'm surprised that Levon rushed with Knight E4. That's why I was highlighting Queen D7 first. Yeah, also quiet moves in open and stun trouble is uh, always the desired move because you keep the pressure. By the way, now the live action is on in the Nodia Bags game. We are seeing the line that we had been discussing. And also, move 40 has been reached now. Extra time will be added to Nodia Bag. Yeah, he's already having 33 minutes on the clock, but there is no need, just he's writing down all the moves. Yeah, there had been so many <laughs> trades, so many exchanges, and uh, clearly, uh, he gonna blitz out, takes, takes a4 and the pawn runs to a6. I yeah. believe Ding will resign at that point. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think Nordebeck either messed up the notation at some point and now he reaches out, he's calculated this through and that's yes. why he had slowed down. Uh, he's just no, so let, precise. No, let's just add one yes. more thing because people don't know this anymore. Yeah, now a4, there is nothing to talk about chess-wise, but uh, the rule says that when you have no increment and you are less than five minutes on the clock, you can stop writing your moves. Hmm. Yeah, so there was quite some catch up to be made and there we go, King D7. And this is exactly what we were discussing. A black skin gets it, makes it as further away as C8, but no way, the biggest mistake that white can do here is the move A7. And okay, there's a move played on the board, but I just want to highlight our point. And that this actually would eventually draw the game. Uh, and, and I think trade. we've got a result. Dingleren, after no progress there, gets the king to c8, but nothing more to be done. Nodebeck Abdusatra finishes at pole position in the round robin with five and a half out of seven, takes down the world number, Magnus, world number one, Magnus Carlsen, in the final round and starts the knockout, taking down the world champion Dingleren in dominating style. Yes, and we have been hearing from, from Ding in the conventional booth that. Yeah, he is already blaming his second move, knight f6. Yeah, but this gives us the chance to jump right into some other action. I also see that Magnus, up, at least according to the engine bar, the evolution bar, he seems to be getting closer to save that. Yeah, it's. Uh, let, let's just get a very quick update at the at the current position, and if we have a chance, so this is move 30. The king on. Yeah, exactly. This was the type of Counterplay I was hoping for from black side, yeah, f5, g5 pawns, white's king on g3, eventually imagine black's king gets to h5, f5, f4, check, will be a checkmating idea, king h2, look h1. So white does not have this freedom of let me just slowly somehow uh, convert this advantage. Probably you will have to try to trade one pair of rook uh, at, a, at a moment. Uh, Peter, really quickly, we left it at rook c6, and while we've still not got a move on the board, let's quickly show everyone how this happened. There was a trade. He did defend the pawn. Yeah, rook d2, g5, yes, exactly, g5, rook f5, making sure that the other rook uh, can be activated. d4, it's a bit of a nervy move. d4, rook e1, check, king h2, rook f1. Now, black is setting to f5, f4, stopping that g3 square and deliver checkmate, so that's why he gets ready to activate that king and clearly eyeing the idea of trading that powerful f1 rook with rook f3 to get stability and get out of all these crazy mating ideas. Magnus Carlsen, under five minutes, ten more moves to go. Niklas, uh, what do you make of this endgame? What are Ali Reza's chances and how big of a role is the clock going to play in this one? 
Well, the clock is going to play a big, big role because the players still have to make 10 moves and Magnus only has five minutes. So that's not a lot of time. That's about 30 seconds per move here. And Firuza is ahead on the clock. Now, King G3 was a good move by Firuza to stop F4 and to stop being caught in, in the mating net here. And this is what Magnus is relying on. So now there's also the idea to play Rook F2 to trade a pair of rooks and target this pawn on f5. And you cannot allow a trade of rooks here with black, so you should play probably the move g6 to defend this pawn on f5. But still, white can play rook f2, and we shouldn't forget the whole time that this pawn on c7 is also hanging. So it looks very difficult still for Magnus. You, have to, you can avoid the trade of the rooks, go rook g1. And there are some ideas here. For example, rook takes c7, then rook e3 checks suddenly. And black is still having a lot of counterplay. Rook f3, rook e2, king h2. You can even come back, threaten this f4, followed by checkmate again. So Firuza has to be careful. But what was played? Yeah, king h7, king h7 was played. Now rook f2 is an obvious move, which Firuza will most likely play. So you cannot allow a rook trade, the pawn is hanging, so f4 check is reaching forced. out. King f3, but now the king feels a lot safer already. And I think Firuza is on the way to win this game. Peter, what do you think? Yeah, he's also reaching out and he has played the move rook f2. Yeah, it, it was clear my intuition was also trade one pair of rooks, but rook f2 is the key move. And Magnus had a very tough time because king h7 was the human move. I would have wanted to say, yeah, f4 check is played. That g7, g6 that Nicholas highlighted that the computer move is, is a move that no human will ever yeah. play, cutting off uh, your king on the seventh rank. Yeah, Magnus is avoiding the rook trade. However, now white's king is feeling very safe. Once black spawn had to be, was forced to um, push to f4, now white's king has always this g4 square. We can't take on c7 because that allows rook e3 check and then all kinds of craziness starts. King g4, rook g3 check. At least we even don't want to calculate those craziness. Maybe computer thinks it's fine. There are also ideas like maybe we can just break this construction with, with h4. Yeah, let's, let's eliminate that powerful g5 pawn and then eliminate, trade one of this, uh, this h pawn for the strong f4 pawn. That's uh, kind of a very natural human way of looking at, uh, at things that comes naturally to me. But maybe also black is having zero stats, but we have to do something with white. We've got about seven and a half minutes, or at least Ali Reza has got about seven and a half minutes and still eight more moves to go. So it is a time scramble for both players. Up upon, I completely agree with you. Going into this uh, race after taking on C7, allowing a check, yes, you step up, yes, you give a check, yes, you go up. Even the pos possibility of just capturing on G2 and this F pawn potentially moving forward, you don't want to think of all of that with three minutes on the clock. No, not at all. Seven, sorry. S summer, it doesn't matter how much time <laughs> you have, you don't want. The, the natural move to me seems like this H3, H4. Yeah, it's just so natural, so tempting to get rid of this bind, yeah? And uh, for example, if G takes H4 happens, then we are happily capturing on F4. And uh, we are out of any kind of uh, mating Let's we do see the evolution by not exactly agreeing with it because probably black will start advancing with his king to h6, will try to push g5 and if black gets g5 check king h5 in, then he will again have a very safe uh, structure there with his pawns and the safe king. A lot of intrigue, a lot of intrigue here, nothing is given. And it comes to that whole thing, right? This popular belief that all rook pawn endings are draw, but I've always found them so fascinating and so rich of these complex ideas, uh, Peter, and so difficult to play. And there we see Ali Reza, he chooses the approach of trying to make sure that the black king doesn't get super active all the way to h5. He goes king g4, he's also threatening the g5 pawn. And now rook takes c7 as well, becomes a threat because rook e3 doesn't come in with the check. The more I look at it, I, I, I like this move as well. You pointed out h4, king g4 looks really nice too. Yeah, this was this was the very first move that came to my mind. However, the problem was that after f4 check, he played the move king f3, but clearly he had to because the rook on f2 was hanging, yeah? The, the black rook was still on f1. So that's why white had to play king f3, now he goes king g4. 
Probably Black will have to step up with the king to h6. And then your idea of h4 might even yes. still be in the air. Yes, exactly. Uh, because <laughs> then you can take on h4 and then come back with the king and Black's king will never be safe. Yeah, once you yeah. push the g pawn to g5. So yeah, look at Magnus. Yeah, he plays king h6. He's not happy. He has to play the move. There is nothing else. But he doesn't do it because he thinks that this is so good. Yeah, White can play knight h4 and breaking this, breaking this structure. And where is the counterplay? Yeah, after h4 we have to take, there is no other move. Then white simply takes back on h4 and then walks back with the king to g4. It, and the rook on c3. The rook on c3 protecting on the third rank, eyeing the c7 pawn, but eventually also Sam very black pushes g5 will be rook c6 check, uh, finishing the game at once. I don't see Magnus escaping this. Uh, for Ali Reza, he's uh, got some extra minutes on the clock to, to be precise here. And if he manages to do just that, it's going to be a winning rook pawn ending in just a few moves. H4 does feel like a very natural move and shouldn't be that hard to find. And especially after king g4, you get in the most ideal scenario possible. Ali Reza really close to getting the job done in this one. Look, but 131, new record. <laughs> 130, 133, 134. He knows that this is winning. He's about to win. Just one more good. good 139, but stay alive. He's going to do it. But stay alive, Faridaza, because, okay. <laughs> what is, what's the limit? It's like 170 or something. I don't it's know, but 139, normally if in a bike you are riding like completely crazy in the gym, then you are seeing, and he Ooh. takes on C7. Why? Why do you, why do you let this look easily kind of, this is counterplay in time trouble? Look at this. Magnus, look at this body language. He sees, he thinks like, wow, well, what? Are you, are you kidding me? Are you giving me a chance to, to muddy with the waters? And you give the world number one a chance. He seizes on it. He's going to take this opportunity. Also, it is the only way to create counterplay. Rookie three, you want to create a race on the board. You want to get a passer on the king side. Three versus two majority for Magnus Carlsen on one side of the board. It's his only hope. The queen side is hopeless for black. He needs to somehow get that G2 pawn. We're expecting Magnus to go rookie three. Peter, he's coming down to about a minute and a half. At some point, he's going to have to start really blitzing out the moves. Yeah, but on the other hand, okay, if you get a chance, then everything will be natural. The, the worst thing is to have a hopeless position because then a bad position doesn't have a good move. Is he thinking about throwing in a g6 and perhaps setting up a kind of a kill zone for white's king? Yeah, but then white can come back with a look to c3. Yeah? Uh, let's just show that because I, I want to point out uh, this idea that after g6, immediately, instead of rook e3, if this now rook lands on g3, it would be a checkmate. Yes. But, once the pawn's on g6. But yeah, if g6, then you have rook c3. So you have to start with rook e3 in order to set up the g6 threat yeah, on the it. board. So he couldn't allow the white rook to step back, take control of the third rank. And Feruja, what does he have in mind for this one? Magnus's next move might be g6. Why? And he goes king f5. Okay, but this is way too adventurous and it's not clear at all. Rook g3, Magnus will be blitzing out his moves. But Peter, I think uh, actually for Ali Reza, the thought that Magnus could get g6 in on the next one, it's a scary option because suddenly your king might be checkmated. Of course, no, king f5. <laughs> but that's why I thought like rook takes this and is insane. Yeah, because you are going into this king f5 craziness adventure when you had this uh, easy win, technical win with h4 yeah. in a time trouble. Yeah, it's, it's 40 seconds for Magnus. Wow. Yeah, but okay, he's very happy. But he still has to make five moves. Okay, I had sometimes six seconds for five this moves in. This was a in, bad move. Yeah, rook g1 is a panic move. And Nicholas, what is the problem? Show us really quickly what's happening here. Alireza is about to make a move. Rook c6, only way to win. Rook c6, only way to win. He's, he's playing it. Is he, yes, oh, he's he's playing it. Rook c6. And then rook g6. Rook g6, and all the pawns are falling. White is up a thousand pawns and it's winning. Wow, so he might have calculated it all. He had this 139 heart rate. I have a 139 heart rate too. <laughs> yes, seeing all this action. And he resigns. Resigns, wow. Ali Reza Feruja wins against the world number one. Magnus Carlsen goes down with the black pieces. What a start it has been to the knockout format. The world number one goes down. The world champion goes down.
Peter, few could have predicted this, these outcomes. Well, but uh, also like uh, Nicholas said, it's kind of the logical outcome of the, the round-robin tournament. Yes, yeah, so far the, the players, all, all these players had been dominating. Uh, and okay, now, now we have a chance to jump right in there. How is Vincent doing? Is his time travel phase over or is it still very much on? Yeah, our leaders are enjoying the moment, yeah, and all eyes on, look at this, no, the time travel is still on, Vincent is very tensed. And Vincent's up on the clock. Up the on bomb. the clock. 30 seconds left for two moves, that's not too bad. It's not too bad at all, and we've been talking about the queen and knight combo against the queen and bishop, but notice how Vincent has managed to just really restrict the activity of that knight, and it came down to that rook trade that you mentioned, uh, Peter, that you were surprised that Levon even allowed to start with, forcing his knight into passivity now. Uh, and it looks like with this h-pawn, it's suddenly, again, a game for all three results, and I'm expecting... Levon to use the distraction on the queen side to free up his pieces on the king side. Yeah, queen h7, okay, forcing... Might repeat. Well, till move 40, he certainly will repeat, yeah? So uh, we are not... He's done to 14 seconds. After king g3, he will play the move queen g6 check. And after move 40, he will get the extra 30 minutes, the extra 30 seconds per move, and then he will be really delving into the position. Yeah, there we go. This is the professional approach. Queen g6 check had and been played. And Peter, while this one um, reaches time control, I quickly want to switch over to Fabiano against yes. Gukesh. And uh, Niklas, get us up to date with what is happening because the players are down to under a minute and still five moves to be made. Yes, still five moves to be made. Rook f2, just the only move to, to keep a winning position. Very strong by Koana. And he is winning, but he still has to survive the next... Four mo moves, five moves. Well, Gukesh also has to survive the next five moves. The, just the pressure on the seventh rank is too strong. The queen is tied out. The rook is passive. The knight is passive. The white piece are so active. Material is equal, but this is a winning position for white because of the active pieces. Well, rook takes, king takes, f6. Quickly played. Three more moves to be played in 40 seconds. Queen a3 check and queen a2 is an immediate win now. Queen a3 check, queen a2. Yes, he finds the Kawana yeah. is so strong, even with little time on the clock. King has to step to the side and then queen a2 or queen b3. That's yeah. just it. The rook cannot be defended. Queen f5, g4. Game, game over. Queen f5, exactly. Queen f5, g4. So we will see this king g8, queen b3 on the board. And uh, well, that's it. And you can see it on Gukesh. He, he realizes that he's walked into this. That rook and, on e6. And 131 heart rate for Fabi. Even he's after finding... Yeah, even after finding... And it still keeps rising, yes? Yeah? So he's trying to calm himself down, but he's, of course, in the heat of the battle, extremely tense. 137, 38. Wow, he's broken uh, the record in the previous one there. 39. This is now equal to, to Alidaza. I think Alidaza was reaching all the way up to 139. And resignation any moment now. Yeah, just Sukesh. 15 seconds and the clock is not even his biggest problem right now. That rook on e6 is about to fall. No way to fight it. Uh, queen f5 is the only move that comes to mind, but you can simply attack the queen. There are probably other ways and we do have a result as Gokesh resigns. Fabiano Caruana with the white pieces gets the win in. And he's the first player with the experience lot. The Kings who's managed to get a point, so... Yes, but he's also the forward. one who is playing with the white pieces, mm. yeah? So he was in the top four. He actually finished on the third position. And uh, the players are just in incredible shape. And we can see there they are... Yeah, for Gukesh, it's just such a difficult moment. He sets the pieces back, trademark Gukesh, uh, regardless of the result. And we see Fabi leave there. We've still got one more game on. So let's head back to Levon and Vincent. We did see the moves being repeated to time control, I believe. Yes, the time control has been reached. Now Levon is thinking. I believe that uh, the position is quite level. I was worried there in the time trouble with this rook knight uh, queen uh, Levon situation. Shaking his head there. Yeah, because, okay, he doesn't really have. The, the queen on Isan is doing an extremely good job covering, uh, keeping Black's queenside pawns in check, yeah, so, and he always has this h-pawn, yeah, so if Black's queen gets activated, try to support the b-pawn, then White will always have this h5 
H6 check ideas based on, on the pin, yeah? And this one check would be very unpleasant because if Black's king would come up to, to G6, then suddenly white can play queen F8, queen G7 check, and black loses the coordination and might end up losing the game. But Peter, if black... Yeah, I think yeah. it's just a draw, and yeah. that, that's a fair result out of this position, because I was just about to say, if Lavon just keeps the H5 square guarded, there's nothing to worry about exactly. for Lev as well. And considering the start of the game and the pressure that Lev was feeling, we had him in the confessional booth, he did create his chances at the end, but for the most part, he was on the defence. Yeah, he should be very happy that he escaped, yeah, because it was a very scary position. The players are discussing, let's hear it. I don't know if we can hear it. Yeah, and, and look at look at Levon, yeah, basically his body language tells it, I escaped, right? It's, <laughs> it just shows that he is, is really relieved and it's understandable. He was also the only player who survived with the black pieces. Yeah, and he will have tomorrow the white pieces to try to win that game and and that would uh, mean that he, he wins the match, yeah? So this, this draw is very valuable. And there were so many complicated lines to analyze and... No, it's impossible for us to too, too quiet. Okay. Right. In this case, you resign. No, you have to you have to take only seven, make a three. King G two D four. Yes. Yes, I was checking this. Queen D eight. Uh, Bishop D four. Well, number two, Fabi, in the studio with Nicholas. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Congratulations, first of all, thank on you. this victory. I think it was quite a nerve-wracking affair, especially in a time scramble, but in the end, you emerged as a winner. What are your thoughts on the game, your first classical game and freestyle chess overall as well? Yeah, it was a really tough game, and I think I was probably worse at some moment. And then I got this chance to sacrifice a pawn with d5, I wasn't sure if I'm worse or if I'm okay there. I, I thought I can't be better, but he misplayed it and I, I got some incredible activity. I thought bishop d6 is probably a bad move. Uh, it's actually funny because I was discussing the starting position with Vincent and with Nutterbeck, mm -hmm. and uh, we decided that c4 was interesting, and then Vincent decided to go with the plan and <laughs> Nutterbeck did not. <laughs> he played e4 anyway. Well, so, c4 and e4 both seem to be good moves, yeah. Yeah, it, it's a very complex position. But basically, my idea uh, was that... Yeah, let's let's have a look sure. together, maybe. So c4, e5, is that a move you discussed in the beginning? Yeah, we probably. thought it's um, either c5 or e5. And actually, b5 was Vincent's idea after c4, but then I thought c5, white gains space and restricts knight on c8. And we thought maybe it's interesting. And okay, here I, I'm just going for like very a lot of space. Right. Um, yeah, I didn't realize this idea of knight h3, which I saw that yes. both uh, Ali Reza and Noderbeck were going for, but that wasn't really the idea of of what we had analyzed before. So, so yeah. you had this direction already in the analysis beforehand? Yeah, more or less. And then I realized that it's probably okay for black. Like before, we thought maybe white's a bit better here, but then I realized that you know I can't. Like the first plan was to play, let's say, castle, castle, and then to play d3. This was. Uh, Vincent was thinking that this is a nice position for White, and then I realized that he plays knight e7, e4, knight g6, and then he'll break with f5. Mm -hmm. And I can't really coordinate in time. So then I realized I probably should play for d4. Uh, right. Which I, I was still quite happy with the position. I thought that uh, that it's, it's an exciting position, at least. Okay, it is quite rich, for yeah. sure. Yeah. I actually thought I would be slightly better here, but I see that uh, that's, um, I'm probably mistaken in my evaluation. And yeah, he so, looks like he played very well. Yeah, he did He did play really well up to a certain point. You even had to play this move f4, which you're probably not happy to play. Well, I was thinking f3, he'll take on g3. And I wanted to keep the knight alive. Like, otherwise I would play f3, but he takes on g3. Yeah, he takes... Okay, I take back probably... I wasn't sure with the pawn, I was very worried about the oh, structure. right, you can take with the queen, of course. Yeah, with the queen, well. but then I... Yeah, I thought he'll take the c-file and... I'm not sure exactly. Maybe I just trade and, and trade queens and and I'm playing for equality, I guess, but but maybe it, it should have been the way I played. And okay, f4 
yeah, my position got quite uh, nasty after 97. And I was actually happy I, I had this rook b3 idea and d5, at least I get some freedom for my pieces. Yeah, we were saying the same. At least now it's a bit easier for you to play. You have some pieces, you have the bishop, so you're probably quite happy to play this move. Yeah, I was very surprised by knight e5, because if he plays knight ft5, I don't get the c6 square. So this, so, yeah, just knight ft5. Right, he could have taken like this to control yeah. the square here knight still. Knight d4, queen g6. Queen and g6. I wasn't sure if I would play queen g3 or rook a3. If rook a3, probably bishop b8. And then rook a4, I can try to attack the pawn from the side. Mm -hmm. um, but so it's not easy to win this pawn. Something like this. Yeah, very often if I win it, then he'll actually start attacking the knight on the e-file, and the e3 is very weak. So of course he should. This was practical for him. I mean, maybe he was very ambitious with knight e d five, but my play becomes easy. Where do you think did all go really wrong for him? And bishop d six for sure. I mean, this felt very knight wrong. Knight c six, bishop d six. <laughs> bishop d six was still fine knight apparently. C4, bishop c4. Knight c four, bishop c five. No, this was all. You know, after I h three, I actually felt that I'm not worse anymore. But mm -hmm. okay, I'm probably losing, and it shows my understanding of chess in general. <laughs> So a6, yeah, a6 I thought knight 6, e5. a6, knight c... Uh, knight 6, because I need to get rid of this knight, which is getting uh, undermined. So, so which move here? Knight 6 to e5. Oh, knight 6 to e5, all right. Knight and okay, six, he protects, yeah, like, let's say queen b7, take, take. I was looking at this position, I thought I would have knight, like, knight g4 at some moment. It looks very dangerous, right, for the but, black king. But okay, there's always knight h5. Chances. But knight yeah, actually, h5 is my, there, my black can defend. Gone. Yeah, so maybe this is actually uh, this king. Yeah, king of eight is a weird move. I have to say, <laughs> it's a yes. strange move. Yes, and I think it really went wrong when he played this queen maneuver when he put the queen on f five yeah. on h six at some point. You know, I already thought after bishop b five, I'm like much better. Okay, my optimism was probably a bit extreme. But it's also very important that, especially with the time getting so low, it's much much easier to play for white. It feels it feels very dangerous because I'm threatening rook takes d five. Like, I, I saw some nice line, like, let's say he plays a6 here. I was actually thinking it's sort of a natural move. Rook d5, knight d5, queen g7, king e8, queen h8, king d7, and knight b8. I thought it's... Oh, it's okay, it's, yeah, that's, that's cute. It's and important. king e7, queen c8, yeah, yeah. so, so he, black he, has to take, and then... It's just, a disaster, queen b7. It's, it's an absolute disaster. So he probably saw that he should sacrifice the exchange here. I just thought it wouldn't work for black, but I, I guess it's it's okay. It's still okay. But it, it feels wrong. I mean... I have still the activity. I move my. King. I was going to move my king somewhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. I wasn't h two or h one. Yeah, and uh, like I, I always have rook d five ideas to start yes. with. He always has to calculate it. Yes, which is difficult. Even instead of king h two, I would wonder if rook d five is not like very dangerous for black. It looks very attractive to immediately sacrifice, come in with the queen, right? King, but apparently, king yeah. apparently, black is safe enough here. Yeah, he has the rook g six uh, counterplay. Mm -hmm. But okay, it's it looks very dangerous to me after rook d one and. Yeah, and after queen g6, now putting the queen on h6, and here you already have yeah. different options. Yeah, I think knight d4 was... The nice thing about this solution is that I, I no longer have to worry about tactics on e3, so my now I can't even risk. So it's also easy for me to make moves quickly. Yeah, and he's completely passive. So yeah, probably there's many ways to win. Queen a2 was a nice touch, bringing the queen over. And yeah, I think from here on... Yeah, okay, there's there was a, no a small hiccup that I missed rook c2. You know, I was actually... Mm. Instead of queen a7, I wanted to play f5 first. It was mm -hmm. my kind of first intention. Yeah. Rook e5, g4. Oh, wow. Knight f6, gh5, knight d7. And then I remembered my game against Magnus yesterday. <laughs> I was like, it's not the same position. Yeah, here I, I probably start to collect a lot of pawns. But I, I had this emotions like, if he builds a fortress, I'll look really silly. You know, so... It might be winning as well, but, well, you no, didn't have be, to yeah. go for it. Queen a7, rook c2, and I, then I realized that, like, g4, rook g6, it's kind of surprising. Yeah, g4, but, rook g6, he's, he's suddenly... Yeah, yeah, it's a mess, complete a mess. A complete suddenly, mess, yeah. yeah. And, okay, so I, I think so it's very important G8. I found rook f2. Because I was down to, like, 40 seconds. I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, yeah like you played rook f2 with 50 seconds. That's the only winning move. And now that you trade his only active piece... What, what is he even going to play? Oh, F6 right loses on the spot, but it's really hard to suggest any move to him. Yeah, he doesn't have threats, so he'll lose slowly or quickly, but yeah, F6 was was a way to do it quickly. Yes, yes. Not a good game. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just really difficult, especially only having 90 minutes on a clock. Uh, how did you how did you deal with that uh, time management? I mean, it worked out for you in the end, but it was probably very nerve-wracking. 
yeah, I was on the back foot for the for most of the game, and I was also lower in time for most of the game. But yeah, in this like dynamics, I, I outplayed him, which was uh, I guess the deciding factor. But yeah, my opening play maybe wasn't the best, uh, and my optimism was <laughs> was definitely not not the best. Well, it certainly helps to be optimistic and to to hope to to bounce back. Tanya and Peter, do you have questions for Fabi? Yes, first of all, congratulations. And I would like to know your emotions when you felt like you don't really have anything in the position. Yeah, Black got quite a good opening. While seeing the other three boards quite dominating for, from the white perspective, did you regret any choice or what went through your mind at that moment? Yeah, I actually had these thoughts like, uh, okay, Notre Beck looks like he's up upon. Vincent, I thought, was more or less winning by move three. Like, I, I was wondering in his game, actually, I'm very curious, like... Yes, if, let's have a look, sure. Uh, uh, he could have played f3 after knight e4, right? Uh, I was... Yes, see, that was actually a line that he mentioned in a confession booth because... Ah, he mentioned it, yeah. Because it was quite interesting with the idea like, to uh, sacrifice even. Oh, no, here, ah, no, he didn't mention knight it Knight b3, bishop no, b4. Knight b3, yes, and yeah, then so here, f3. Right? Yes, f3, how, how, knight takes c5. Bishop takes g7. I was thought, que idea. wait, what, what happens after queen h4? Oh, H4. no, I, the bishop on a1 is hanging. <laughs> I thought, no, I was like thinking during the game, knight b3, oh. queen b4, the knight's trapped, oh, but it's not trapped. trapped. but uh, <laughs> still here. Okay, maybe it's still interesting, bishop g7, but uh, I actually just missed that <laughs> the bishop is hanging. Oh, yeah, you have so an intermezzo of bishop g7, that's So true. otherwise this would just win. But there's also knight, knight a6. a6. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, so difficult. The, the line that Vincent said that he spent all his time was that f3, knight takes d5, bishop takes g7 check, king takes g7, and knight d4. And he thought like with this queen g3 check, knight f5 coming should be winning, but then but he was... But it's 96, yeah? Yeah, yeah he was yeah. saying some incredible defense for black, and then well, he and decided yeah. to just play a3. It's, it's very important, yeah, this 96 yeah. move, otherwise you lose. Yes, yes. No, it's such a, such a random, because you don't see these patterns at all, it just doesn't happen, so it's completely random stuff. Exactly. And Fabi, we were just wondering, there have been different opinions on this time that the players get between the revealing of the position and the start of the game, the 10 minutes that you get to discuss. Does it take away the freestyle element of the uh, format? Uh, it's definitely entertaining to watch. What are your thoughts on this? I don't think it really changes too much. I, I guess it's sort of fun and it gives you a little bit of a... Um, like, you don't have to think on the first move with the white pieces. But, uh, like, we decided to play c4 and then Noderbeck decided to play e4. Uh, contrary to our to our preparation <laughs> and and then we didn't even consider this knight h3 ad at all uh, could you come a little bit this way yeah, sure. quite yeah. so yeah i don't know 10 minutes is is really not enough to get to the heart of any starting position and uh, you mentioned that in another fish, in another fisher random uh, event on st louis it's a lot longer amount of time so it really doesn't make a difference uh, in this format no amount of time that you get will ever be enough yeah <laughs> Maybe a few years. <laughs> a few years. We might have a theory. By the way, the other thing on which we've had a lot of opinions being discussed is the players' jackets. Uh, give us the scoop on it. Did you guys decide your colors? How did you pick? And it's a purple one for you. Nice one. Well, I, I decided another color, but I was tricked and oh. given this one. <laughs> I was forced into purple, but it's not bad. I, I think it's uh, purple is a nice color. What was your color of choice? I think, well, I was only given the choice of purple and orange. I didn't realize other options were on the table. So <laughs> it's like purple, I don't know. So I picked orange. And then I think Ali, who got orange? Vincent? Ali Reza, Ali Reza yeah? Ali Reza. Yeah, they mixed us up. I think they also gave me his size at the start because uh, at the start, of, my jacket was really, really too big. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was uh, and his, I think, was maybe a bit small. So I think we, we got uh, mixed up. Well, it looks good in the end, and congratulations on finally getting the win today uh, after an up and down game. Thank you. Uh, we look forward to seeing you back in action tomorrow, Fabi. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Fabiano Caruana with a win against Gukesh. Uh, it's just game one of the mini match. It is a best of, do best of two. The players will fight back, and there are some players who have to win on demand to take it into tie breaks tomorrow. Uh, Peter. Yes, uh, and there we see the results. Yeah, Abdul Satulov uh, getting up a hand right from the beginning against Dingri and winning a very convincing game. Vincent had excellent chances at the beginning, but then Levon with that stunning Rook B7 defense and then things uh, turned. I think Levon at the end uh, should be even happy. Uh, Vincent should be happy that uh, the game ended in a draw. Fabiano Caron, we have just seen his game and his game analyst to, to his game against Gukesh. And... A game that we have been focused on, Ali Zafiruza against Magnus Carlsen, 
Phil Ruzsa has played some brilliant chess. That idea with knight h3, he was the first player today to have played the move knight h3. Mm. After Abdul Satulov has also followed up <laughs> with knight h3, that, that idea put pressure on Magnus right from the beginning. Then he ended up in an unpleasant endgame. It looked like he's getting some chances, but finding time trouble, Ariza was also very convincing. And Fabita said that he was very happy. He's very happy with having these extra minutes before the start of the game where they can at least get a feel of the position discussed. But in the end, you know, it's not as if all players go for the same approach. We saw them switching it up. As you pointed out, different first moves. And now this means that Dinglerin, Gukesh and Magnus with the white pieces in the final classical game of this mini-match. It's happening tomorrow. They have to win on demand to take it to playoffs. Meanwhile, Vincent versus Levon. That stays level. Uh, Peter, looking at the form of the players, who do you think is likely to manage to get into that tiebreak? Well, I would actually forget about the players. I would like to look at the overall scenario. Yeah, that we, we have seen that also today's position was quite scary for Black right from the beginning. And uh, I do believe that it's much easier in freestyle chess, in free and random chess to bounce back because there is no opening stability on your opponent. Yeah? yeah. How do you stabilize your position? Yeah. You have to survive the first moves. Yeah, Magnus right after move three was under pressure. Dingley then already complained that on move two he made a mistake. Uh, no easy way of, you know, trying to get your draw and qualify. It's going to be a hell of a fight. That certainly will be something that the players who lost with the black pieces will be looking forward to. I was just thinking about that, Peter, that in standard chess, when there's a mini-match and a player takes a lead, so many times we see the Berlin appear on the board or the Tarash exchange appear on the board. We see quick repetitions, a really solid approach, and a player never really manages to get a game. But in freestyle chess, it's impossible to shut down a game. It's impossible to get that solid position. So players will get their chances. There's definitely more to fight for more to play for. Uh, we've had such a great day of chess today, big battles, and of course, uh, with the Nordebeck win, the Ali Reza win, uh, some fantastic endgame techniques there. Chad, it's been awesome, and one more time before we sign off, we're gonna hand it over to Niklas with his thoughts about the action that we saw. Niklas, who are you expecting to uh, see bouncing back tomorrow and taking it into Armageddon, uh, into playoffs? Well, First of all, I'm really impressed with how Nordebeck beat the current world champion Ding Luren and also Friuza beat the world number one Magnus Carlsen. That was both in very convincing fashion, really, really strong games for both of them. So honestly, with the shape that they present themselves in today, it will be really difficult. Of course, you never bet against Magnus Carlsen. And we saw also today that there were three white wins. So definitely the players who lost with the black pieces today, Gukesh, Magnus and Ding Liren, will have a chance to come back tomorrow. It will not be easy and I'm really looking forward to it. And Tanya and Peter, this has been such a great day of chess and so much action, so many decisive games. And I'm looking forward to see tomorrow who can come back and force a tiebreak. We are so excited for the final, the final classical game for the quarterfinals. We might even see an eventual Armageddon tomorrow on the board. The tie breaks will happen right after the classical game. We had three decisive games and one absolutely topsy-turvy battle between Winston Keimer and Levon Aronian that ended peacefully. For now, it's a goodbye from us, uh, chat. We will be back tomorrow, same time, same place. But we leave you with an inside into the analysis, the post-game analysis between Vincent and Lavon. Take a look, we'll see you tomorrow. But after c4 bad. is very bad for black. I didn't see a move in the first move. Because I was trying to figure out what to do. It's not clear because I was thinking like knight f6 on the first move. 
D4 and B5, that is fine, but B4, it's yeah. not clear what to do. No, I thought like, okay, C4, you have B5 as you move. So, so Knight D4 was probably the win, yeah? Knight D4, so takes on F3, D4. Where? For who? F8. What do you mean for who? Queen when Knight D4. When you play H3, Knight, knight D4, Queen E7, Knight F3, Knight D4, Rook G, ah, Rook G3, King F3. King F3, you resign, no, you have to, t you have to... Take on e7, knight f3, yes. king g2, d4. Yes. Yes, I was checking this. Queen d8. Uh, bishop d4, yes. No, bishop d4 loses. Queen d5. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. No, this, this is losing, yeah. No, wait. Queen d5 and king h7, yeah? Queen yeah, e8. But, no, I think just but queen e8? Yeah, queen e8. No, I don't know. Bishop d4. Yeah, I, no, I saw knight h4 check there. Looks very dangerous for you. King, you mean after I take on e7, yeah? Yeah, knight h4. King h2. King h2, uh, and d4 here. Okay, we should d4. We should d4. Queen c6. This was the problem, I think. Because queen d8, uh, king f7, king g3, queen f3 mate. Queen F4, Queen G5, <laughs> or Queen G2, <laughs> everything is there. Oh wait, Knight D4. Can if I go back to G1, does something change? I mean, after check instead of. So Knight H4, you want to play King G1? I think King G1 doesn't work. No, I thought King H2 is the move. Oh, yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah, like D4 check G5. C1, C4, you can take D4. Yeah, 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 I thought it doesn't work. No, no, I thought King H2, yeah. D4, and I couldn't can't play can till the end. Queen F6, right? Yeah. This, this is something I saw, I didn't like. Well, queen F6 is fine, right? DC? Okay. Oh, wait, no, she's on C3, yeah, no, it's not good. So it's on E3 for some reason. No, D4, I thought, like, Queen D8. King f7, seven. Uh, queen c7, king e6, king e6. Oh, I saw something here that I didn't like. I mean, I wasn't 100% sure. I thought it should be very close to winning, but... You blundered this rook b7 idea, yeah? Not exactly blundered, just like but I saw rook b7 and you have no real next move and it felt castle. like... Yes, I understand, but still. But because if I don't do it, I'm completely lost. Yeah, completely. But I mean, I mean, knight h six, h three is forever. Yeah, yeah. Paqueto. Uh, you want to take a quick look there? Yeah, yeah sure. Because it's interesting. Uh, it feels like something was very wrong for, for you. Yeah, with the position. Yeah, but after c four, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> I mean, it's I a horrendous position. B five. Why is b five so? C five. D six. B four. Okay, but I lose the c5 pawn, yeah? I yeah. take... I'm not sure, but at least I lose a pawn. Wait, where was this? Forget the starting position, yeah? This is what happens. Okay, so you mean this one, yeah? No, I mean, I would have sacrificed, yeah? I think just... Except that it's like pawn down, but... I'm ah, you mean this? Yeah. It's so ugly for me, yeah? so many dampy, yeah? Okay. It's kind of solid, yeah, like knight f6, e6 castle, mm. somehow it's kind of easy to develop, right? Okay, so Where am I with the... Okay, knight b3 maybe, right? Okay. Where am I going to put the queen? On f5? Yeah. Oh, yeah. c1, yeah. Yeah, but what's, um, what's the big deal? Knight f6? Yeah. Ah, maybe this was the, the only way to play, because what I played, I knew that it's not good. Yeah, I felt... This looks... Yeah, but surely this was the right square. I mean, you can also go to h5, but then you're in like this pin. Or b6 is maybe a square. But I mean, at least I was not sure, yeah. It's, I mean, I give a pawn and it's not entirely clear whether. But uh, I mean, it looks. It's dangerous. Tremendous, sure. yeah. Yeah, queen b6 probably. Or d6, yeah, it's a good square. Yeah. Six bishop b5. Yeah, but bishop b5. Hurt. d4. I don't know, it's unpleasant, yeah. Yeah. Okay. At least bishop d4 is kind of, you're not fixing it with a 
this. Yeah. Such a beautiful position. Yes, uh, that's <laughs> not an I Maybe take it. Yep. Hmm? EF or GF? And now C6 square. Yeah. <laughs> it's a weird position, yeah? But okay, I lose a pawn. No, I saw it, but I was, I, I was sure that it's bad for me. No, I thought that this... Because uh, I was alone. I know, I said nobody came. <laughs> so I thought this is interesting. Of course, it's extremely risky. I mean, there are so many moves for you, yeah? yeah, yeah. But I thought, oh, but yeah. I didn't, like, I really would have loved to kill. But no, sure, I saw it. I, I saw it, yeah. I mean, of course, here yeah, I also have this idea, yeah, it's also very dangerous, I think. Because yeah, you have to yeah. Go to B6, which but is I thought it's not such a big deal. Okay, but you're, like, completely... Paketo? Yes, I mean, when you look at the bishop on A, it's... Uh, Paketovich, yeah? What is Paketovich I'm not afraid of? But why, how are you and developing? And? Yeah, but I mean, I would li like to take the bishop, yeah? Like yeah, of course. So I'm sure. also like, because you have huge issues here, otherwise, of course, you would go back like this and play e6, knight e7. Yeah. I didn't know what to do here, yeah, because knight e4. Yeah. I think I have this to do has this. To be yeah? so bad, yeah? Yes, yes, it looks ridiculously bad. <laughs> I, was, I was sure that it's not going to end well. Yeah, I mean, probably I should have. You can do this, anything, yeah? yeah? <laughs> it's so good for you, yeah. I or knight to f3 also, oh, I thought okay. why, yeah, well, anyway, we will go here. Yeah, yeah. I will not go to d2 ever, and then... Okay, so you went here. Yeah, here. Yeah. And, and I think we should have just used this. Yes, yes, yeah, I think we should be too so nice. Okay. Yeah, of course, there's this move here, but... No, but knight f5 I didn't like. Generally, I yeah, rejected I it. On bishop e2, I wanted, you know, once I had this chance to stop bishop e2, I was already... Yes, I should have done it earlier. Yeah. I was like, okay. But okay, I, I thought that this just doesn't work. Okay, this... On the f5, you played. I played, yes. Here. Oh, because like h6, I think is very bad here, right? There was something wrong with it. Like knight e6, f6, gf, gf, rook f5, queen g8, bishop h5 was kind of... I didn't believe in this, no. Yeah. No, I thought this is a must. Yeah, but now king g1, h6 is maybe you survive, yeah? And king g1, even knight h6 is not such a, not no, as no. bad as it could be. No, but it should still be lost. Eh? I wasn't sure. What do you do? Because I'm not allowing this bishop to, to, to come out. Because I have this and then castle f6 quickly. Okay. Like. Okay. What do you want? a4? Yeah, of course. I look at you. Okay. Do your worst. <laughs> Maybe it's not the name. Okay, you can also like, Yeah, but this is it that easy? Ah oh, no. Because yeah. I have this f6 at some point. I don't know. Queen e7 I thought. A4 is not killing you. A4 here. Ah, so you stopped me, huh? No, I'm not sure, but uh, but this felt winning, yeah? Like this. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> You're forced to do this? Yes. Yeah, other moves, but okay. Here, I already don't believe in anything else than what I did. Yeah. So, um, bishop is here. No, but I thought. Wait a second. I thought there. There was something else for you. Not what? Yeah, I thought that this is dangerous. I thought that this is dangerous. This is the most dangerous. So, castle f6. No, but you just take f5, yeah? Why do you care? Just take and go king g8. Ah, like this. I mean, knight gets to e6 and I lose, yeah? So no, okay, but it takes some time. So oh. I think it, yeah. That's true. Maybe I'm in but time. Yeah. I'm, I'm not time. Yeah. I was not sure, yeah? Like, I didn't. I mean, okay, I get the pawn on e6 and you, that you can't even take, yeah? And, like, I have one free move that I just. I was actually also extremely worried here. I thought that something can go wrong very quickly because yeah, some, at some point, <laughs> some rook f6 I thought is gonna make. Oh, if I castle, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, in this case, I should have taken. I thought yeah, like about I a4. Did safe? you think about a4 yeah, here? Yeah, this was my main move. But like, this is if I want to be very safe. Yeah. No, but this cannot be worse for both. Huh? Takes h6. Yeah. I okay. don't think it can be worse. No, I mean a4. I wanted to play. No, a4 was uh, oh, okay. a4 kind of critical. Take. Queen e2, yeah. Yeah. Queen a4. And yes. Oh, exactly. Bishop b2, yeah. Yeah, bishop b2, knight b4. 
that's where I spent all my time. Yeah.